new restrictions are now in place in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire to help stop the spread of COVID-19. We are now in the high alert level. This means we all have to take extra precautions to keep everyone safe. Being at the high alert level means we must not mix indoors with people from other households. This means no mixing with other households in our homes and in places like pubs and restaurants. We can still meet indoors with people who are in our support bubble. And we can still meet people outside in parks and gardens if we follow the rule of six. We should aim to reduce journeys and walk or cycle wherever possible or plan ahead to avoid busy times and routes on public transport. It's vital now that we ask everybody to follow the new measures that have been put in place. It's really important that we do absolutely everything we can to protect the vulnerable and the older people in our population and also to protect our NHS. We want to avoid a situation where cases of COVID-19 rise and we may need to have further restrictions put in place in our area. We need to continue to follow the guidelines where we are washing our hands, where we are wearing a face covering and where we're keeping our distance. Anybody that does have symptoms of COVID-19, which could be a high temperature, a continuous cough or a loss of taste or smell, must immediately self-isolate and get a test by calling 119. I want to thank everyone who's doing their part to stop the spread of coronavirus in our towns and communities. We all have to keep working together to keep people safe in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. This winter, more than ever, with COVID-19 still circulating, we need help to reduce all avoidable risks. You can help protect the NHS, social care and loved ones by getting the flu vaccine. You may be eligible for the free vaccine at your GP or local pharmacy if you are over 65, pregnant or have a long-term condition. Find out if you are eligible at nhs.uk forward slash stay well. Children up to year seven can get the free nasal spray at school or through their GP if they are below school age. If you are not eligible for the free vaccine, you can pay for it at your local pharmacy. The flu vaccination does not give you flu. It reduces the risk of catching flu as well as spreading it to others. If you had the vaccination in the past, that will not protect you as the flu strain changes every year. So you need to have a new one this year. It is also important to wash your hands often with warm water and soap. Use tissues when you cough or sneeze and bin used tissues as quickly as possible. Thank you for helping to protect yourself and loved ones this winter. My name's Jonathan Gribbin. I'm the Director of Public Health for Nottinghamshire County and I'd like to tell you about the COVID-19 Local Outbreak Control Plan for Nottinghamshire. It's all about containing the virus so that we can protect one another, safeguard our critical services and enable our schools, our workplaces, our communities to flourish again. And the plan describes how we will do that in Nottinghamshire. It complements the national test and trace arrangements and it builds on local arrangements with key partners like Public Health England, the District and Borough Councils, the City Council and our local NHS. It identifies a range of settings such as schools, workplaces, universities, care homes and so on which require specific plans to deal with any fresh outbreaks of the virus. It describes how we'll be monitoring on a daily basis to spot if there are any new outbreaks and then coordinating action to investigate and deal with them, deploying extra testing capacity if we need to or contact tracing as appropriate. 
The plan also deals with how we will continue to provide support for people who are made vulnerable because they need to self-isolate and we'll be doing that through our community support hub. And we'll refine the plan as we go along to reflect the latest best practice and the information which the government will be providing to the council. Finally, I want to acknowledge the lengths to which so many people and organisations have gone to already in recent months to stick with the guidance, to maintain social distancing of two metres wherever possible, to wash your hands thoroughly and frequently, to stay at home if you or someone in your household has symptoms, to get tested and to follow the advice that you receive when you get the result. By observing the guidance, you're protecting not only your own life and livelihood, that of your friends and also your loved ones, but also that of people you may never meet, but people who you're depending on and whom we must each depend as well. Your role in that is critical. Thank you for your help to contain the virus. This winter, more than ever, with COVID-19 still circulating, we need help to reduce all avoidable risks. You can help protect the NHS, social care and loved ones by getting the flu vaccine. You may be eligible for the free vaccine at your GP or local pharmacy if you are over 65, pregnant or have a long-term condition. Find out if you are eligible at nhs.uk forward slash stay well. Children up to year seven can get the free nasal spray at school or through their GP if they are below school age. If you are not eligible for the free vaccine, you can pay for it at your local pharmacy. The flu vaccination does not give you flu. It reduces the risk of catching flu as well as spreading it to others. If you had the vaccination in the past, that will not protect you as the flu strain changes every year, so you need to have a new one this year. It is also important to wash your hands often with warm water and soap. Use tissues when you cough or sneeze and bin used tissues as quickly as possible. Thank you for helping to protect yourself and loved ones this winter. We're live, Chair. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to this meeting of the committee, which is being held remotely, with the majority of the 11 members joining the meeting from their own, as well as myself. The other members present in the meeting today are councillors Martin Wright, who is the vice chair, John Doddy, Kevin Greaves, John Langdon, who is substituting uh, for, for Councillor Wallace, David Martin, Liz Plant, Kevin Rostens, Muriel Wise, Yvonne Woodhead. Uh, Councillor Diana, Diana Mill uh, may join us uh, during the Chatsworth item. 
Health Watch Nottingham and Nottinghamshire is represented today's committee meeting by An 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 Janta Biswas. Uh, is, is Ajanta here, by the way? I can't see. I am, yeah. Oh, yes. Hello, hello, Ajanta. Hello. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, we will be joined today by members of the NHS representatives to inform our discussions. These are, bear with me, there's a big list. Uh, Lucy Anderson, Head of Mental Health Commissioning, Contracting and Performance, CCG. Carol Cockling, Cocking, sorry, Interim Director of People and Culture, Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. Lucy Dadge, K Chief Commissioning Officer, CCG. Nina Ennis, Associate Director and Program Delivery, CCG. Caroline Nolan, System Delivery Director, Urgent Care, CCG. Mark Simmons, Divisional Director of Medicine, NUH. Stephen Smith, Head of Community Commissioning and Contracting, NUH. His business cards must be really interesting to fit all the words on. Uh, Becky Sutton, Director of Community Health Services, Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. Catherine Pope, Clin Clinical Director, Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. We also have the following officers present today. Martin Gately, Health Scrutiny Lead, and Noel McMenamin, Clerk to the Committee. The meeting is being held in live with the new requirements of the Coronavirus Act 2020. Please do bear with us if we experience any technical issues. If we do lose any member from the call, temporary officers will seek to assist and get them reconnected as soon as possible, hopefully without the need to halt proceedings. Officers will inform the meeting if they are unable to rectify the problem and if we need the meeting to be paused or adjourned temporarily. During the discussion, I will uh, ask that members refer to the agenda pack page numbers when referring to points within the committee papers. Item one, minutes of the last meeting held on September the 20th, uh, 29th of September 2020. Are we, are we happy that the minutes are correct and a true reflection? Anybody, I think we'll do it. If you're against, say, yeah. So come on, if there's anything on there that, that you want to bring up. Okay, then we're happy that the minutes are agreed. Lovely, thank you. Apologies for, ask, uh, for absence. Uh, can you let me know if there are any no, please? Yes, Councillor, uh, with apologies uh, from Councillor Wallace, who um, is on other council business, and Councillor Longdon is substituting. Um, and just to flag up, Councillor, we just need to also to confirm the minutes of the meeting on the 14th of October. Thank you. Um, and uh, Councillor Wise is indicating. Thank you. Councillor Wise? You're on mute, you're on mute, Muriel. I, I was going to make that point that Martin's just made, that uh, it's the minutes in, of October that, that also need to be yes. agreed. And I, yes. I have a matter arising from those minutes. Do you, want, do you want to bring that up now, or do you want to bring it up? I can bring it up now, if you, if you like. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, okay, yeah, no problems. I just wondered if we have any feedback on the... Um, on the, the request we raised about the um, continuing other services while the rehab centre was established. I think we put a request in that um, the other ward would stay open for either six months or a year to yes. see that the need was met. Yeah, thank you for that, Muriel. Yes, yes I've been in uh, contact with uh, Lucy Dadge, um, who is going to be speaking about that today. Oh, um, fine. Put her views forward on that, um, and and then uh, we'll make a, a decision of whether or not we accept what she says or not. So it's that absolutely down to the committee to decide how we want to progress with that as a, as a recommendation from us. But yes, okay, so that's communication. You. But I don't want to steal um, Lucy's thunder. No, let, no. Her, let her explain to us. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, any declarations, uh, uh, do any members or officers yeah, yeah. present have any declaration, disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? Chair, chairman, may I, can I just come in on what uh, Muriel said? Yeah. Uh, I think you may be at cross purposes with Muriel. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. This is the downside of working from home. Lucy, come here. 
that down, Shep. Come here. Sorry about that, everybody. It's, it's the downside of working from home when you have two lovely dogs, which are normally really well behaved. Right, sorry, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you, you may be at cross purposes with Muriel. I think Muriel was, and, and forgive me, Muriel, if I'm wrong, was referring to Loxley Lodge staying open. Uh, and it's a transition. And aren't, you aren't, aren't you referring to Chatsworth and Lucy, Lucy coming on? No, later? no, no, it's a transition. It's yeah. transition move into the rehabilitation centre where we said we want to do yeah. keep the okay. keep services going between yeah. six and six months and twelve months. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lucy Dodge has been in contact with me about that, and I've said, well, she needs to bring that to you, the committee, uh, to explain a uh, 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 point of view, and then for us to ask questions and then decide how we want to go forward. So that's a separate item on today's agenda, or will it be included? It's, yeah, in I something? think it's. I think it, I think we need to do it because obviously it could have a quite a, a big impact on on yeah. what happens, and and, I, and it's not for me to decide that I'm happy that what she said. To me, it's for it's for the committee to decide that, um, and, you. and you'll, you'll have the opportunity to ask ask Lucy questions. Yeah, I agree with you, Keith. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you, much, Martin. Thank you. Okay, okay, right. I get back on to item four then. Do any members or officers present have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? Do any members or officers present have any private interest, pecuniary or non-pecuniary, non to declare? No. Now, you would have all have received the email from um, Noel and Martin saying that we're moving um, item six forward. Yeah, so we're going straight on to... COVID-19 restoration. Okay, we all, we all, so if we all get that on, our, on that page, that'd be brilliant. This, this report provides an update on actions being taken to restore core NHS services during the pandemic. Lucy Dadge and Nina Ennis from the CCG will introduce the item in more detail. Lucy and Nina are joined by Caroline, Caroline Nolan, from the CCG and Mark Simmons from NUH to provide additional information to the committee. Thank you. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, head off then, Lucy. Thank you. Okay. Yep, thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm, so you've had a paper. We don't plan to do a presentation, um, but I was just going to give you an overview of the paper and then also, as, as you said, we'll deep dive into two particular areas. So just to reiterate on the background, this is very much about restoration of services following wave one of the pandemic, which, as we know, was April to July this year when the NHS was asked to systematically restore services that have been stood down to create capacity in hospitals and in the community to care for COVID patients. And in wave one, um, I think it's something like the 17th of March, there was very clear guidance from the government on what changes we were required to make, what services we were required to stand down and new services we were required to set up and how they were to be set up. Um, and as you would expect, where we stood things down, we documented uh, those services and we documented our approach to stepping them back up again since July. So the paper that you've got, the main paper, gives a detailed summary of the services, specific and individual services, that were affected by wave one of COVID. Um, and uh, Nina and myself are happy to take any, uh, any questions of detail on those individual individual services just to as you can see from the paper we've rag rated them so effectively some services have been restored as they were uh, some services have been restored differently so maybe virtually because it's it's safe to set the services up again and we've got the resources to do that but not face to face um, and a few only a very few services haven't been restored so um, I think in for the time that we've got on this today um, Nina and I, I'll pause in a minute, Nina and I are very happy to take questions on the table that's in front of you, but we've also given you two detailed appendices which uh, deep dive into to, to changes in some of our more specific pathways which we'd like to take separately. Um, and as the Chair has said, Caroline Nolan um, is going to talk you through how we um, how we changed our urgent care pathway in response to wave one of the COVID. And we're also delighted and very grateful to have Dr Mark Simmons with us today to talk about 
um, reconfiguration of stroke services and uh, just Dr Simmons is um, an um, ITU consultant so ha has joined us which we're really grateful um, at this busy time. Um, so if we could take those two items separately, if we could start with the table um, about restoration of services from wave one um, and also we recognise that we're now in wave two and the system is very busy again. So whilst this paper doesn't cover that, we're happy to um, respond to any of your questions about um, where, where we can about the state of the services at the moment um, as pressure is rising. So if I could just pause and if we, if we could just take the items in that order, that would be really helpful. Chairman, you're muted. And, uh, yeah, somebody do the presentation first, because I've got two people putting their hand up. Are you happy to wait for the presentation before you ask a question? Yeah, I've got, sure, got Muriel and uh, David. Apologies, we weren't going to do a formal presentation, Keith. We were going to speak to the paper in terms okay. of the table of individual service changes, and then Caroline was going to present on changes to the urgent care pathway separately right, okay. and Dr Simmons was going to present on the stroke reconfiguration. Yeah, right. we uh, just to explain, we don't have uh, Dr Simmons on the call as yet. Oh, right. oh, um, um, and um, he hadn't provided uh, mobile contact details um, when requested. So uh, we're, we're we're looking to email him to get him on the call. But if, you, if someone from uh, CCG can contact them urgently. That would yeah. be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Caroline here. So I'm in contact with uh, Dr Simmons and had indicated to him that quarter to 11 would probably be an appropriate time for him to join because he's stepping out of ITU to join us. So I think he'll be with us shortly. Um, and if not, I'll get back in touch with him. That, that, thank you very much for that, Caroline. Thank you. OK, so good last question. Keith, my apologies. I wasn't. I didn't. I wasn't quite clear whether Lucy wanted questions at this point or yes. whether we were going yeah. to have the presentation. Do yeah. you want questions now? So, if we could, um, yeah, if it would be okay, if we could have questions on the table of individual services that have been stepped yeah. down, and then we then Caroline will talk to you about um, the urgent care pathway, and with, um, Dr. Okay. Simmons will can join us to talk about stroke reconfiguration. So, if we could do it that way, that would be really helpful. Okay, brilliant. Okay, that's uh, David Martin first then. Can you put his hand up first, Muir? Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. All right, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, morning, Lucy. Morning. And, uh, committee. Uh, yeah, reading through the appendix, it's uh, excellent news that things finally seem to be getting back to normal. And whilst it's not at full capacity, it's clear that we're getting closer. It's clear that patients are still worried about attending appointments in person. And that's why it's important that if there is a uh, it's not a clinical need. We're carrying our consultations remotely. The use of technology has no doubt saved lives, and for that we are grateful. And we know that from the Smarter Working Programme that we implemented at the County Council with the carers and the system. It increased the output by 25%, and people do get used to it. Uh, so it's a very good and safe way to deal with people who are already in that risk group to start with. Um, it's clear that since the start of the pandemic, you've made many changes to the services and you're keeping ahead of the game to help keep our patients safe, including pausing or limiting various services to focus your resources appropriately. And the, some of these must have been really tough decisions to make because they're quite vital services that you've been altering. Um, bearing that in mind, and the national rhetoric hasn't changed and we're now in another lockdown, has the trust faced uh, reticence from members of the public uh, returning to one-to-one -one consultations when they have to do so? Um, so I so I think from a CCG perspective um, we have done quite a lot of work and I think Ajanta would probably be able to um, interject actually because Healthwatch had been really helpful in getting um, insights from patients about the extent to which they are comfortable with virtual consultations. Um, so 
I suppose if, you, if you, your question is that I think we've, we've found that the majority of patients who have had virtual consultations have found the, the, the trade-off between getting it easy and early access when needed and having to d do that not face-to-face. -face. They, we, we've, the, 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 the um, citizen insights say that that has broadly, um, that has broadly worked well. Obviously, we've got so, and that tends to work for people that want urgent on the day type access to primary care, and a huge, particularly with primary care, a huge amount of that can be done virtually. Um, I think we do still obviously have to manage um, the, our citizens who have long term conditions and who may who may benefit for and be more used to face to face type appointments where they might need blood tests. So um, I have to say it's a mixed bag. Um, I don't think people have been reticent and I hope that we've got the right balance between virtual consultations and face to face where they're absolutely necessary. I mean, the, the point that we would want to make from primary care is that it, it is open, it remains open. Um, and um, I think, um, you know, from an acute uh, hospital perspective, exactly the same um, approach really has been taken. So I may not be answering your questions directly because it's a broader uh, it's a broader question, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go on to uh, Chatsworth Ward because we've got a separate paper about that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Muriel. Sure. Thank you, David. Yes, um, yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Lucy. Good morning. Uh, I've got a question about the um, crisis teams and a yep. question about CAMS. Yeah. Um, uh, to be fair, my question, I'm, I, I am concerned generally about the capacity of the crisis team to respond. I think that's an ongoing issue, but I've had a particularly fraught weekend uh, over a resident who uh, kicked off on Saturday afternoon with uh, quite difficult behaviour. And um, through till this morning and, and actually during uh, Saturday night, I've been in contact with uh, our uh, uh, out of duties team, the police, the crisis team, uh, our mental health services, and um, the immediate the the outcome of them over the weekend was that he was uh, uh, placed in the custody suite in town, uh, and and then obviously had to appear in court yesterday. So it's been an extremely fraught weekend uh, for both him and his wife, uh, following requests for a mental health assessment by his wife and from myself. To be fair, um, Ainsley is taking the case to the, um, is it the mental health multi-agency yeah. meeting today yeah. to see uh, that if it can be reviewed. So it may be exceptional, but I'm just so concerned that um, somebody uh, known to, the, to to one service who'd been in hospital um the crisis team said they I understand said unless he he, he was uh, in danger of committing suicide they weren't going to come out and uh, and see him so the the whole weekend uh i mean i thought the days when people ended up in custody with mental health issues had come to an end uh, and the fact that he obviously had to go to court yesterday because he'd been in custody of the weekend. Um, I hope that this was an exceptionally uh, exceptional case. But if not, it's, it's really worrying that um, in terms of the liaison, the response of the crisis team, um, yeah, those two areas, uh, liaison between agencies, access to information uh, because it seemed that each of the agencies was looking at a bit of information but not looking at the whole picture which I would have thought if they had done would have led to a mental health assessment on Saturday afternoon rather than having to go into custody. Um, and the other question is about CAM support. Again, again it might be my more local experience, but I find it really difficult to get the door into CAM services open, um, both from a GP point of view and, and certainly from uh, a counsellor point of view. 
um, it's encouraged there's going to, there are going to be mental health support teams in schools. Um, to be fair, I've not seen evidence of any in my patch. It may be that we're not in the pilot area. It's, it's, a, it's a very good concept. I just wondered, you know, how much progress is, and it's obviously only going to start from uh, September. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear, you know, what early uh, outcomes there'd been and is this going to be a, a well skilled up and resourced service um, rather than um, support mental health support to pupils being pretty thin on the ground? Thank so, you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Wise. I mean, I am going to, I think if it's OK, Lucy Anderson is on the call, who is uh, one of our very senior mental health commissioning leads who might have a little bit more detail but if I just give a bit of context mm. I mean you're absolutely right in terms of crisis services the point of them is that they're to help people people to avoid people's mental health crisis escalating um, so if indeed um, the message that you have been given is correct that is not what we would be expecting the crisis service to how we would expect it to result uh, respond um, and you are absolutely right that custody or a section 136 suite is absolutely the last place you would want people in mental health crisis to be so i would hope lucy i'm um, sh hopefully can provide a bit more clarity um, around the service that Notts Healthcare set up in the first in the first wave of the pandemic, that this is an isolated incident. But as ever, we're very happy to, to I mean, I'm happy to talk to you separately and, and look into individual cases. That's the first one. In terms of CAMS, um, we have, you're absolutely right, you know, the model for CAMS support is to get CAMS support into where children are and children are in schools so that those services are integrated with their kind of day-to-day -day life. And there's been a huge amount of work done. Um, I listened to a very compelling presentation recently with our patient experience group or, um, use, that, that used MH2K and, and actually got children's representatives involved in telling us what good services would look like how they would involve you know um, carers and families as well so that's sort of a general overview but I don't know Lucy are you able to respond any more specifically to Councillor Wise's two questions apologies um, Tam, over to you yeah if I could um, morning Councillor Wise um, I think um, it's really your kind of overview I think like Lucy has stated isn't how we'd expect services to operate. So if it would be okay with you, if I can um, go through Martin and, and contact you directly, because what would be really helpful is to have some of that detail to work through um, with different organisations. We do actually, and it is taking place tomorrow morning, we do have a multi-agency um, group to look at urgent and crisis care, which is exactly what you've described. And some of the examples um, are what is really, really helps with our learning across the system. Um, so I, I can raise that tomorrow, but actually I, I would really appreciate having some details so we can work through that with the agencies. Um, it does have healthcare trust representation on it, um, local authority um, representation, place, um, the um, acute trust. So it, it is really broad. So it would be really helpful to work through some of that because I think um, regardless of what services we commission, unless services work together, I think the areas that you have highlighted will we'll never really optimise um, the service that patients are receiving. Um, with regards to CAMS and um, mental health support teams in schools, um, I'm going to cover a little bit of that in the, the next presentation item that's coming up. Um, but I'm probably like you, very keen to talk about mental health as well. Um, one of the things we can do is share the details of the rollout of the mental health support teams, because you're absolutely right, they are being piloted in different areas. Um, and like Lucy's highlighted, that is really to provide more services in schools where children and young people are. But if I can provide some more of that detail, then it will just provide kind of the timeline for rollout of those services. Are you happy that that's left for the main presentation on mental health, Muriel, yeah? Oh, certainly. And Lucy, I'm uh, Ainsley's taking this the case to the meeting tomorrow. Ah, uh, so, OK, great. So I'm, yeah. Uh, okay, Lucy, well, that's fine. Ainsley. Well, that's fine. So I'm then happy I will, that... um, I'll pick it up tomorrow yeah. then. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the offer. But, yeah, she's going to take it to the uh, multi-agency OK, meeting well, we'll, tomorrow, we'll so. pick it up from there. Thank you. And right. in terms of the... 
uh, cans, would it be possible for us to have uh, a list of where the where the pilots are taking place? Yeah, so that we yeah. can support them. Thank yeah, you. of course. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks. Are you, are you happy, Muriel? Yes, thank you. And, okay, I've, I've got uh, Liz Plant next, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, actually, my questions were all about CAMS, and obviously, if we're going to have that discussion further on, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Liz. That takes me on to agenda then, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm coming back uh, to <laughs> originally when Lucy said that, you know, uh, Health Watch would be able to give more uh, information on the question that was asked about how well uh, the face-to-face -face or lack thereof of the consultation, remote consultation is received. And uh, uh, while I'm very happy to <laughs> vouch for uh, Lucy's initial statement that overall um, uh, from the survey that was done of two thousand approximately two thousand if I'm not wrong Lucy majority felt that the phase two you know the virtual consultation and not traveling worked but we have had a closer look at the at that data and the report and uh, health watch has got grave concerns of all the data that has not been reported and I will just pick out three here so uh, 63 percent uh, of those uh, contacted said that that they actually wouldn't contact primary care because they don't want to add pressure. So if they had any health issues, they wouldn't get in touch with GP because they were under the impression uh, NHS, which is exactly the messaging and perhaps the messaging, especially during the second wave, I, I'm not too sure if it has changed, but needs to change. The other two are a little bit more uh, uh, serious. 66% said that they are not comfortable on getting advice on new, lo new mole or new lump in the virtual consultation, uh, which is exactly what we are talking about. Uh, if there is any initial uh, uh, recommendation of requirement then to have cancer diagnosis, then this rings alarm bell. And 51% said that they don't want to discuss mental health issues in a virtual consultation. Now, these are really uh, uh, worrying data. Uh, so I would encourage CCG to look at uh, although, you know, the headline is fine that majority are happy, only marginally majority are happy, but all the data that is there, just because they are not, uh, uh, you know, just fall short of that 50% borderline, please consider the other data because the data is quite worrying of just moving to phase two, you know, moving to virtual consultation. Thank you. Chair, if I could, if I could respond just briefly. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, Lucy, I've, 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 Lucy, we've got two Lucys now, haven't we? Sorry. Lucy Dad. <laughs> Lucy yeah. Dad. Yeah, I was going to bring you in now. I saw your hand. I, 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 just so you all know, I do see your hands come up because I've got it all on the right hand side. So be, be assured that I will pick you. It really helps is once you've spoken, though, you do take your hand down. Thank you. So, so having yes, I, I recognise I sort of failed to um, answer Councillor Martin's question. Um, I will potentially also bring Lewis Atoria in, who's done a really um, comprehensive piece of work, which Janta will know around sort of the CCG insights into how the public have responded. And um, it's always good to let the experts um, talk um, on these matters. Just a general point for me, though, is that I can tell you that our GPs are really, really clear that. Um, their patients know that actually they want to provide as much face-to-face -face care as they can you know they have, they can provide adequate and safe care virtually but it's not the way that they would want to provide care so you know the message that that patients feel that they don't want to trouble their gps um we will work i mean you know certainly lewis is Lewis and colleagues will, will support us on that to make sure that the public understand that um, you know where face-to-face -face care is 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 right and safe it will be provided so just to be clear that that, that it's not a way of working that um, certainly our GPs um, enjoy. In terms of your specific questions Ajanta, um, I'll pick up the teledermatology one. Um, it, tele, teledermatology has been something that's been um, 
a model of care actually pre-COVID and there are very safe clinical protocols. So it'd be good to pick up separately, if, if that was OK, why that gives patients particular concern. Um, and, in, and, and again, with mental health, I mean, Lucy might come in, but we did see a quite a significant drop off in people accessing IAPT early on in the in the um, in the pandemic, which the providers have worked really hard to open up more access um, and again to encourage people that they're open, they're open for business. And yes, it may well have to be virtual consultations, but that those consultations can be conducted safely and fruitfully. So they're um, two things that I will we can definitely pick up separately. But I don't know whether Lewis, do you want to add any flavour to the general patient insights thing and give um, any comments around how we respond to that? Yeah, so is this specifically in remote consultation, the remote consultations bit of that work? Yeah, so I suppose when, when we asked the public, do you support continued use of remote consultations? The answer we've got back, and we asked 2,500 people, so a representative sample of Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, the answer to do you support is yes, but with the but being, it depends on the care setting. So more supportive of remote consultations in a GP appointment, um, fairly supportive in a hospital appointment, less so mental health appointments. And the second but is dependent on the content of the conversation. So for things that have perhaps already been diagnosed, that aren't complex, uh, that don't require a lot of investigation, people are quite happy to talk remotely. The things that are maybe more complex, uh, things that have required a lot of different appointments already, people are less comfortable talking about them remotely. Uh, there's no correlation with some of the demographic factors we expected to, to be important. So age isn't a factor. People across all age groups are supportive of remote consultations. Um, some people will talk quite a lot about how convenient it's been. So if it's a routine appointment, being able to quickly have your appointment while you're getting your kids ready before you go out and do what you need to do has been really good for people. It's where you need a sit down, focused, complex conversation uh, that people are less supportive. And I think the, the other thing, the major finding of the work on rent consultations are is that there are some populations that are really struggling. So if you have language or literacy issues, if you don't have access to a phone or the internet, the remote consultations are problematic for you. So what we're currently doing is we're taking all of the inside work, so a little conversations on that, and drawing up an action plan uh, to respond. So some of this will be working with our own staff and our own clinicians about how to make better use of remote consultations. And some of those um, actions will be around trying to address some of the barriers some people have in accessing and looking at what remote consultations are for and, and what they're not useful for. I don't know if that helps to, to answer a little bit more. Do you want to come back on that? Agenda? That does help, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, very quickly, can I just say that you are absolutely right, Lewis, that yes, 2,500 is a sizable proportion. But out of that 2,500, 307 did say that they strongly oppose to the GP, you know, virtual consultation. So I think we need to, with health inequalities tomorrow's and the NUH, everything that is coming up, we need to be mindful that, you know, this doesn't exasperate the health inequalities. If there are three hundred patients who don't want uh, or are strongly opposed to out of the 2500 strongly opposed to the GP consultation around 400 strongly oppose hospital um, virtual consultation then we uh, uh, you know need to look at those barriers that uh, uh, are there so uh, Lewis's answer does reassure me thank you going to come back Lewis yeah, no, I think it was just to echo that, fi that final bit, bit of jam. So that's exactly what we do over the next couple of months is working with the people who can't, who can't access remotely to see what we can do. So thank you. Lovely. Are, are you happy now, Agenda? Yeah, happy. Lovely. Can we have Kevin then, please, Kevin Greaves? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, one of the questions have been answered uh, 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 a janta uh, asked a question for me actually and uh, quite a good uh, reply um but having said that uh with doctors doctors appointments uh these residents in my area in my ward that 
have difficulty getting appointments with doctors virtually uh, and uh, with uh, virtual face-to-face -face or virtually. So maybe that's a question for another committee in another day. Um, on uh, page 22 or 46, children in care services, uh, you're saying that about the backlog that there was uh, that occurred after the uh, first uh, lockdown. Um, is that still the case now? Are, we, are children still still being uh, seen face to face, or have we gone into a lockdown number two, which we have, and our children still uh, are children struggling now to go and have a, a, a face to face meeting? What I'm saying is. Is this up to date? Because this was 15th of the 7th, uh, and now we're in lockdown too. Is this the case now? And uh, it says increased capacity to ensure these are undertaken in a timely manner. Uh, can you explain what the timely manner is? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, just sorry. Um Councillor Graves, in answer to your two questions, so access to general practice, I understand that we are coming to talk to you in December about that, and I'm going to bring um, our Associate Director for Primary Care, who will talk to you about how we um, how we um, support general practitioners across the board in ensuring that there's equitable access to primary care. So if you've got any specific concerns about practices in your ward, it would be really helpful to receive them ahead of that and we can make sure we cover your particular concerns if that's okay um and no we and uh, yeah so we can we can deal with that um and forgive me i'm just trying to find the, the reference that you made now what i can tell you is that children in care we have a statutory duty to provide them with um appropriate physical and other health checks and they are there is a there are quite specific time constraints in which we have to do that and they are all part of the our sort of statutory duties you are right that this paper was written at a point in time um, what again i can do and we can do quite easily is give you an update post meeting on our position today in terms of children in care who are waiting for appointments which will be more up to date than when the paper was written if that helps okay uh could, through you, Chair, uh, could I ask um, what the backlog was before and how many was the backlog? And obviously you can't tell me where it is now because you don't have that data, I assume. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I'm, now I'm going afraid for, for that question. Lucy, I don't know whether you would be have access to that data. Sorry to ask you. Um, I detail. don't know, but I can, I can pick it up with colleagues as well. Would that be okay if we gave you a specific response, Councillor Greaves, to your question? Uh, yeah, well, that would have to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we've learned, I mean, the two things I can tell you, that in phase two, we've been told quite specifically that some of the services that we stood down, we were asked to stand down in phase one or wave one, we aren't, we will not be standing down. So the government are really clear that, that the, you know, business as usual has to continue through wave two of, um, of, covid so i would anticipate that that we will not be certainly won't be exacerbating our backlogs um but i i need to get you some exact details on uh, where we are with that particular patient cohort uh, yeah, yeah happy kevin uh yes chair thank you very much thank you. i've got john doddy next please uh, yes uh, thanks very much in, indeed kate uh, I can say that uh, at this moment in time, there is absolutely no reluctance whatsoever on patients to contact GP surgeries. And I would say numbers are way, way back to normal, if not exceeding normal. I would like to say on the mental health point of view that I found patients actually uh, extolling the virtues of the telephone call because of the, 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 the remoteness of it being its actual selling feature, that they feel more comfortable in secure surroundings dealing with these things at a slight distance, as long as they've got the time, as long as people have the expertise in actually dealing with that. 
So I, I would say that general practice is robust at the present moment uh, and, and, and practically back to where it was. We had a list of services. Uh, I can see you shaking your head, but I, I deal with this every day. We had a list of services of which we were not able to provide. Do you know what was on it? Ear syringing. And that was about it. So that's the level of restriction that exists in general practice. Now, I'm going to show you a letter from Stephen Short and the team at the CCG representing 1.1 million people and 130 practices in Nottingham. You were asking about up-to-date figures. These figures are for September, September 2020. There were 530,000 appointments in general practice in our area in September. This is a staggering fact that this is 18,000 more than the same month last year. 18,000 more people were seen in September of 2020 than were seen in 2019. In addition to that, that was despite the fact that we are uh, encumbered with uh, PPEs, etc. It said the 56% of the appointments were face to face. 56%. You're looking for up-to-date figures. You're looking for robustness. This is the most staggering set of figures that you'll actually see with the robustness of the return of general practice to above normal. Not normal. 18,000 more appointments in September and a, a very high level of satisfaction. So on the ground, general practice is uh, fit and well and performing above what it did this time last year. And there may be anecdotal cases of people who have anecdotal problems, but they are September statistics of 530,000 appointments, 56% face to face, and you can't argue with that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Gerling, I'm sorry to interrupt the flow of the meeting. Um, no, no, that's two, all right. I'll turn um, the bridge anyway, Lucy. Yeah, our two expert colleagues who we really benefit from hearing doc, from Dr Simmons, who's going to talk about stroke reconfig, has a very short window of time now, about five minutes, I think. And Caroline, who's going to talk about um, urgent care, needs to be gone by 11.30. Could we move on to those issues? And we're happy, then we can do a wrap up of any outstanding questions at the end. Yeah, are we all right. happy with that? Yeah, OK. Uh, Apologies. Uh, uh, no problem. Yeah. We'll come back to that. OK, then, do you want to lead on so, to that straight away then? I think everybody's I'm spoken anyway, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. I'll waste very little time on stroke reconfiguration. Dr Sims can talk through with you a change that Nottingham University hospitals made in wave one of COVID to create COVID capacity and um, align, realign uh, stroke services. Um, Dr Sims can talk to you about what it means in practice and we can also talk about it uh, at the, on the next gender item uh, around tomorrow's NUH for help. So Mark, over to you if you're still with us. Yeah, sure. Sorry for the um, short timeline. I'm on intensive care today, so apologies for, uh, for, for having a limited time to time. Um, so the stroke move from City to Queen's was uh, timely and, and has actually really allowed us to, to, to have the COVID space that we need at the city campus. Um, you will um, be aware that we, we made this move back, um, between May and July of this year. I planned it in May and, uh, and actually made, made the move in, in, in July, moving acute services from the city campus to Queen's. Uh, stroke now has a, um, a, a space within the ED uh, to do that initial evaluation right next to a CT scanner. Patients then moved up to a, a hyperacute stroke unit, um, which is almost directly above ED, and, uh, and, a, and, and an acute unit next door. Patients are still having their rehabilitation within a, de within a dedicated unit over on Daybrook Ward on the city campus, um, and uh, we've reconfigured the two what were general medicine uh, wards at uh, the Queen's to uh, being stroke specific. So um, there is a therapy gym. There are, uh, we've made some changes to, to the way the, uh, the, the ward flows. And we're currently just putting in a occupational therapy kitchen for people to have their assessments uh, and, and to work up the therapy side of things uh, within the Queen's campus. Um, for those of you that are, uh, uh, have been around for, for a long time will know that moving stroke services from City to Queen's has indeed been a long-term goal, but actually um, the short-term requirements of COVID at the City campus um, brought this opportunity and in fact has been incredibly helpful in the last few weeks in creating um, uh, HCOP, a, a geriatric space for COVID patients over on the City campus. 
Um, so moving stroke has helped in multiple different ways and I'm happy to take any questions um, prior to a more formal evaluation, which would be happy to share with you probably early in the, early in the new year. So I haven't got the exact numbers now to, to share with you and because we're doing a three to I think we're doing a four month evaluation of the move. We will bring um, that information to you in the new year. But my understanding is that initial, the initial findings is that uh, it's a very positive move overall. Lovely, lovely. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation, Mark. I mean, uh, the stroke, the, re the response to uh, stroke victims is is so positive when on hospital admission. I mean, I think we've got an outstanding team in in the county, which we're very appreciative of. And uh, I, can, I can see that moving any move is has got its glitches, hasn't it? But I'm, I'm sure it's a, it's the right thing to do. The, the area that concerns me more is the uh, post-discharge physiotherapy support. It's it's really excellent while people are in on the ward, and you can see people improving rapidly. Um, but then it seems to fade when uh, they get back home. You know, I suppose it's partly people keeping up their motivation to do what they need to do, um, and. I see some of the residents in my patch uh, become putting on weight, becoming less mobile and kind of giving up. Um, I just wondered if is that a concern you have or is it is it kind of part of the improvement that the uh, that you're seeking? Thank you. Um, so uh, stroke is a continuum from the minute the literally the minute that the, the event happened through uh, their hospital stay and, and into rehabilitation. Um, again, those of you who have been uh, in the health circuit for some time will know that there was quite a significant um, discussion and changes to the post-discharge rehabilitation of stroke in, in recent years, and, and there has been some difficulties in that area. Um, I think the, the move that we've done this time around very specifically focuses on that first hour and hours of a yeah. patient's day and yeah. and therefore you know the move to queens was always was always on the cards and the right thing to do i do share your concern because i do see stroke as continuum from from the moment it happens until someone is as back to as normal a life as possible um and uh, and i think uh, our work with um, uh, social care and um, healthcare teams out in the community needs to continue so that we have a, a, a robust long-term rehabilitation um, uh, uh, offer to our population. Um, if I was if I was being broader, um, I, I think the concern goes beyond stroke actually, and I think um, uh, the, the the rehabilitation agenda across knots probably needs to be thought about uh, in the in a in a wider context. Um, there is some very, very good work going on with uh, with major trauma rehabilitation. We have a, a, we have a separate neuro rehabilitation um, uh, center which isn't linked to stroke. We've got stroke rehabilitation. We have trauma re so uh, there's lots of lots and lots of work going on in rehabilitation, but much of it is siloed. Um, I would be keen to to understand that better uh, on a more global perspective, and uh, your support with that would be uh, would be um, uh, appreciated. So yeah, your point is very well made. Are you happy with that, Muriel? Yeah, you're on mute, but I guess it, I guess you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just 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 to add uh, add to that, the physio. Obviously, some of you know I had my back operation a, a few months back, and and I've been contacted four times now about physio. So so it, you know I know it's not uh, in person, but they are checking up on me, making sure I'm doing what I should be doing. And I think I've got another another call scheduled for um, the beginning of next month. So there is an ongoing care. I know that's not stroke, it's back. I don't know if it is that classed as major trauma. I don't know. It felt major trauma to me. I can assure you when it did me back. But um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, my personal experience is, is it, you know, they're doing as much as they possibly can under, under the circumstances. So, you know, I think... I think if I'd have expressed concern, they'd, they'd, they'd have done more. But but anyway, I just wanted to add that in, really. Do you want to come back on that, Mark? Did you, I thought you put your hand up, sorry. Um, 
Councillor Girling, it's um, Lucy here. If we could move to urgent care, that'd be great. We can pick yeah, up urgent possibly, care, then. Urgent so care. If we, we could pick up rehab more in the round when we talk about chats. Yeah, yeah. We've got yeah, Colin to the I'll, community I'll, I'll trust. I'll myself told off then. No, urgent no, not care. at all. No, I just wanted to make sure that we got the benefit <laughs> of Caroline's input before she has to go. Urgent on. care. Yeah. So, Caroline, can I hand over to you? Would that be okay? That's great. Thank you very much. And sorry that Thank we've got some much. time pressures today, but um, I'm sure you understand why. So um, I'm talking to you about two significant changes for urgent care, really, that we brought about during the COVID uh, first phase pandemic and that we're still building on and retaining through uh, our strategy. So the two things that I wanted to focus on that were within the paper were the 111 first development, um, which has gone live in the background um, since the 28th of October and there will be a national launch for this on the 1st of December. So you're going to start to see quite a bit about 111 first in the media. Um, we've successfully implemented this at both Sherwood Forest and uh, NUH, so that, that's the good news on it. And what this change is all about is encouraging the public to use 111 or their local GP practice as their first point of call for urgent care. So a lot of people already do this, but there are some that, that don't do that. So the, the national um, push on it is let's get more people using remote access, if possible, either by telephone or online, to get their first point of advice for urgent care before moving to an ED department department and risking uh, the nosocomial infection that has sadly become uh, an issue within the COVID pandemic. Um, we're doing quite well with, with the 111 implementation. We're doing also doing well with the public listening to the key messages around where to access emergent and urgency care. So you heard the stats around uh, UCGP practices, which is, which is exactly what we're, we're looking for. We've got increased use of our urgent care centres, etc. So it's we're starting to see the kinds of developments that we know will be supportive. The benefits of 111 first for the public are that if you use 111 and you, you speak to uh, a telephone operator, if you need a clinician, you'll be transferred to a clinical advisory service that for Nottingham and Nottinghamshire is provided by NEMS, um, so an established provider in our area. They will take you through, not an algorithm then, but a clinical assessment process and, and signpost you to the most appropriate place, which might be for a time slot to attend the ED department. So there's a real benefit to our public to using 111 to get their first point of advice because you'll get a, an appointment time slot within ED or you might get some advice that says actually it's the pharmacist for you or in fact it is your GP practice. And if it is your GP practice, again, the patient will be facilitated to get, to, to get support to make that appointment. That's a key change. And then another key change is that we're trying to use departments beyond the ED department where appropriate. So if that clinical assessment says the patient needs to be seen in a same day assessment unit, that's where the patient will be given an appointment for rather than going to the ED department. So we're reducing congestion within our ED department through that initiative. So you will start to see people being advised to go to what we call hot clinics, where there's a, a consultant and team, multidisciplinary team there that are in a position to provide on the day assessments as well. So um, some really important work that's starting to gain pace. We've got good cooperation with our um, acutes. We've got some really good work going on with local GP practices who are supporting me in the delivery of this. So good initiative. Start to hear more about it in uh, nationally from the 1st of December. Well, I think probably the week before. So in a couple of weeks, we'll start to see hear more about that. Um, the other one that I'd just quickly like just to touch on is we moved the primary care stream out of the Queen's Medical Centre. Um, back end of March in phase one of COVID, and we moved it to uh, the platform one on Upper Parliament Street by the train station. We've retained this change, and largely because we're still trying to maintain as low numbers as possible within the ED departments. We have seen that the footfall of patients with primary care issues has reduced into the um, ED departments, which is right, because it's better that people access primary care in through their practices. But those that do uh, go to ED are being diverted to the uh, platform one practice. The numbers have reduced but what we have seen is increased numbers of people accessing telephone based appointments or telephone advice in, the, in those periods as well so that's a change that we've reta retained whilst we certainly have the, the covid restrictions um, in place 
So those are the two things that I wanted to focus on today that were the, the key changes we made um, throughout the pandemic. And I've got four minutes if there are any, any questions that um, people would like to pose. I can't actually see any hands up. Anybody want to ask a question? Martin, Martin Wright. Thank you, Chairman. This, just, to, just to clarify something that's, that's in the paper, are, are, are you saying that the the aim is to uh, ask patients to call 111 before attending uh, accident and emergency whenever possible. Is, 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 that, is that what we're talking about? Because For urgent care, where it's not an emergency, so where it's not a life-threatening event, where it's an urgent, where the patient believes it's urgent, but they're not sure of the urgency of it or where to go, that's what we're asking, yeah. Because the the reason I I ask is that uh, on a on a personal note, my wife had an eye problem and she she stuck it for two or three days. It wasn't going to kill her. It was just driving her crazy as eye problems always do. Yeah, and we she rang one 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 and we live in Mansfield and she was told to go to Ripley, when a mile away in a straight line from my house is the accident and emergency at Mansfield. So obviously we went there. Um, if they're going to make appointments for people to go to to see people to see to have the care of an eye, for instance, we've got to be sure that we're being sent to the right place and, and yeah. not into another county. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I support that. Yeah. Muriel. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I think it's really good that you're focusing on a specific message around 111, even, even given perhaps some of the difficulties Martin's indicated. I think that the challenge at the moment seems to be getting messages clear for the public. I think when the Secretary of State said uh, we, we, we need to move to all GP appointments being uh, online, that kind of scared quite a lot of people. Um, and uh, that that message has had to be kind of reworked and, and modified, hasn't it? Mm. Um, I think going back to the point that Councillor Doddy was making, that um, that if fifty six percent of patients with GPs are happy with the uh, face to face and, and are getting that, it still leaves um, almost half the uh, population uh, not not getting face to face or not happy with online contact so it's I think what i'm trying to say is um i think people need to 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 feel um not clear about what they can expect from each intervention you know what can they expect from a gp contact what's realistic what can they expect from 111 um and then but it needs to be delivered you know, if those areas don't deliver in a way that <clears throat> people can trust, um, then it, it leads to confusion as well. But, yeah. Uh, you know, the, yeah. So you I what mean? Yes, I do understand what you're saying, and, and I think we've we've thought carefully about this, and we're being guided by like the national com, comms team and locally in the CCG as well. There's a, a lot of support around uh, the, the the discipline of behavioural psychology that's actually influencing some of the one on one messages. So I think. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're getting the right messages, consistent messages delivered kind of across the country. That said, it's really important when people can't access via online or telephone that we don't block their way to healthcare. So we're very clear that in this initiative, if people do turn up at ED, they will be seen. There may be a conversation about the fact that you could have used this alternative service because there will be posters describing what all one first does. But in every event, patients will be seen and given advice for the next time. So I do understand what you're saying. And I think we need to be really careful and consistent about the messaging. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Liz, Liz, do you want to jump in? You're on mute again, Liz. Unmuted, right. Thank you. Thank Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick um, comment, really, on... One, uh, on page eight of the report, we are shown a table of um, numbers who attended pre-COVID and then attended during COVID. 
I'm actually amazed how, you know, there's not that much difference between. I would have thought there would have been considerably less during the COVID period, but obviously the table says otherwise. So that's just a comment. And my my question really is, what train, I mean, one, one, one staff obviously have a very crucial, will have a very crucial job now, and obviously more so going forward. Um, it, it, as I, that's obviously the direction of travel. I just wondered what the training um, those staff have, because, I mean, you know, they are really making some hmm, quite crucial decisions, really, in terms of where to signpost people. Yeah. So the core handling staff in 111 uh, go through a training programme that, that's uh, based on algorithm training, basically, so telephone based appointments and following an algorithm. So there is very little deviation from that, that, that those um, telephone handlers are allowed to make. So they go through a basic training programme. The important bit beyond this is if people if it's not exactly clear that you're, you're um, deviating from an algorithm, a clinician gets involved. And that's the really important bit about how we've commissioned this service in Nottingham. We've gone for our local NEMS provider where we, we've got confidence that we've got GPs, advanced nurse practitioners who are skilled in this area, taking the calls that don't fit neatly into a, a straightforward algorithm advice. So I get, I've got a lot of confidence when we um, move people for clinical advice that, they've, that they're getting appropriately trained individuals supporting them. We monitor to that we do a range of monitoring so we listen to calls from the public so we, there's a process by on a monthly basis we take a case and we listen through so how did the call handler handle it how did the clinician so we audit it and then we also compare the outcomes when things go through just one 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 and then when they go to a, a clinician so there's some fairly um, robust countermeasures that we have in place to try and ensure the quality is right I really apologise now, Councillor Girling, but I need to go to chair the system call. So if there are any further questions, I'm sure Lucy will make a note for me and I can come back to you. That would no, be you. brilliant. Thank you and good luck. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. OK. So, sorry about that, chaps. Does anybody want to uh, ask any questions carrying on on that? No? Well, I'll just summarise then. Um, oh, I've, in fact, I've got a question. I've got a question, actually. I've got to written it down, so I know I've got a question. You know, with, with all this, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm staggered by the, uh, the amount of additional appointments that John Doddy was telling me about, uh, 18,000 additional from last year. That's a massive amount. Um, do, what's, our, what's our general view uh, in terms of the, the, the use of virtual once all this sort of calms down and we get this vaccine then? Hallelujah, we're all cured and we don't have to worry. Because because I know within my work environment, we, we don't feel we'll ever go back to how we used to be. We feel that the virtual element to our, our work is gonna is gonna get stronger and stronger. Is that the general feeling within the medical profession as well? Um, there are other colleagues who could respond to this as well. Councillor Girling, but I think um, again we'll come to this. I think in tomorrow's NUH presentation, we we don't see any reason why people should be brought into particularly acute hospital settings when there is no benefit for them to do so. Obviously, some things you have to go to an acute hospital. Uh, you know, things like complex, highly specialised diagnostics tests. Um, but I think where I mean, it's a combination of that kind of behavioural change with patients and doing what can be done remotely, what can be done as close to home and in the home as possible, um, and only bringing people into hospital and other um, care settings like that when necessary. So I think yes is the answer, but it's not something we want to force, um, but I think we want to get the best out of it. Yeah, OK, thank you. Is that, is that it? Is anybody else going to come in on that? No, right, just to summarise then, I think um, uh, I, I am actually staggered by the amount of appointments, to be fair. And I think we should be mindful that there will be um, incidences where it doesn't work. Yeah, but they, they, they're sort of, um, when you've got those sorts of numbers going through appointments, you're bound to get that. So it's about just being mindful for that, I think. Um, I think there's some fantastic examples of the care um, continuing and actually improving on for people, and I think you should be congratulated on, on, on that. Um, and I know there's some great examples of that. Miura, you wanted to come in, did you? You're on mute, Miura. I know. Uh, just very briefly, Chair, it just um, 
something I, sh I should have said to Lucy Anderson. Um, the the reason I brought that a case over the weekend that's troubled me so much was not so much for an analysis of that particular case. I was just wondering if it reflected um, undue pressures on the crisis team. And at, at some stage, I, I'd, I'd like us to hear how well resourced the crisis teams are and uh, you know what life is like for them, really. Okay. Thanks for that, Is that okay, Lucy? Do you, you see the point? Yeah, I'll pick a little bit of that up in um, the next item that I'm going to cover, but um, we can do something in a bit more detail um, at a later date if that would be helpful. Yeah, a bit yeah. more data about the resources that the teams have, really. Okay, um, actually, there's an item coming, sorry, um, in December, which is on crisis support. So um, we can right. um, include some of it in, in the December report, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. John, did you Thank want you. to come in? Um, I was just going to say, Keith, that when you look at uh, the consultations and face-to-face -face, throughout the period of time of COVID, many of the providers never altered their service whatsoever. And I'm talking about things such as phlebotomy services, because you can't do them remotely. They have to be done face-to-face. -face. Many of the nursing services which were out there never changed during the whole of COVID. And therefore, there's a huge amount of face-to-face -face consultations which were maintained in 100% of their integrity. And I, I think that although people concentrate on the GP side of things, the GP are only part of the platform of care in primary care and therefore they only represent a certain number of the appointments but huge other numbers uh, were maintained in their entirety and I think that's why a lot of the figures look a lot better than people ought to, thought they might be because there isn't a way of providing those services virtually and there never will be so that that's why a lot of figures are looking exceptionally good thanks Kate thanks, thanks for putting the context into that uh, I've got David Martin wants to come in. Thank you, Eric Chair. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, it's very reassuring for members of pub members of the public, especially the older generation, that you're all being so versatile and diverse in the way you've approached the whole situation. And I think it's commendable. And, and it's been a real learning curve for both patients and the NHS in general. And, and I, I applaud you all for it. Thank you. That, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, right, well, uh, I think now then we're going back on to item five. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting nods in the right direction of it. So uh, the report provides a briefing on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on mental health and on support available to NHS staff. I welcome Carol Cocking from the Healthcare Trust and Lucy Anderson from the CCG to introduce the item in more detail. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, just to say, we're going to do um, the update in two sections. Um, Carol's going to cover the impact that COVID has had on workforce at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust. Um, and how that's actually being managed. Um, and then if it's okay, Carol will take questions at that point um, as she has to actually attend an instant um, management meeting at midday. And then I'll um, pick up some of the discussion that we've had and provide an update on um, performance against national standards and service transformation that's taking place in Nottinghamshire against the mental health standards, if that's okay. Perfect. Carol. Okay, thank you. So I welcome the opportunity to talk about um, our workforce during um, wave one um, of the pandemic and uh, moving into wave two. Now, I have bear with me thinking back to the start of wave one, although it's not that um, long ago, um, it feels like um, we've done quite a lot of work and implemented quite a lot of, um, well, deployed quite a lot of things to be able to manage during this time. So what I'm going to talk to is um, our capacity, um, how we've managed capacity of staff and also um, supported wellbeing and move a bit to the planning that we were doing um, to um, come into the current period that we're in now, um, wave two. 
So um, back at the start of phase one, we moved into um, business continuity. And um, to do that, we have um, daily sit reps, which I'll be doing um, at midday today on our staffing levels, um, looking at um, the impact across professions, across wards, so that we can ensure that we've got our um, safety in our staffing coverage and numbers and take appropriate action. Um, we had at that point, uh, we did alter some services um, in order to redirect staff to essential services, and that's part of our continuity management. And um, in the papers, I gave you some examples of uh, where we had done that. But what we also did was look at our corporate redeployment um, and to um, where we got staff that um, are clinical or trained to um, who could be deployed to work in different ways to make sure that we are um, directing our resource to where we most need it. So um, of, of corporate redeployment really is our force, first port of call. We, um, we had Apart from sort of divisionally supporting staff, we also ran a quite a large campaign to increase our bank staff, um, not just clinical, but also administrative as well. So um, we were able to recruit um, quite a number of staff. Um, we looked at how we could do that recruitment, given the restrictions we had at that time. Um, and also made sure that we could still deliver essential training, which really um, looks at hospital life support um, and our managing violence and aggression and uh, things that we need to do um, face to face, but do it in a safe way, which we successfully did. We also put our induction online um, to ensure that we could continue that throughput of staff um, coming in to support our services. Um, we additionally supported bringing back staff for, who had worked with us um, and had retired as well. So when we looked at the figures in um, for the phase one, we looked at the amount of um, absence that we'd had um, coupled with the staff that we had um, managed via um, bank. And um, we therefore are able to plan for um, the second wave knowing that we have got the levels to manage safely. Um, and um, we, we did manage through um, wave one um, with those means. In terms of staff wellbeing, um, we've done a, quite a lot of work um, to support staff. Um, we have start, created a staff support team who provide a signposting service. This is work that we were doing in any case, but we've um, brought forward to um, signpost staff to the support service they may need, um, whether that be occupational health, whether that be a counselling support or really any other sort of health support. We've got MSK um, as well. Um, we, as well as um, the support that staff can contact them for, they have been contacting all our shielding staff to uh, make sure that um, people who aren't able to attend work are we are in regular contact with them and should work come that they can do at home um, we have we, we include them in the redeployment so to keep people engaged with work and offer them support um, so that that's taken place that's worked really well we've done our all our risk assessments on staff the risk assessment process um, is routinely updated with national guidance um, as is um, how we are deploying PPE, the use of PPE and our guidance to staff. It's been um, a changing piece, um, but we've had regular communications to staff and we've been able to do that. Um, equally, staff swabbing um, and that information and support has been available. So we were asked as part of um, NHS planning to look at um, restoration, recovery and reform of our services. Um, restoration really bringing back all the services to um, the um, current contracted, you know, running and uh, recovery, catching up on the um, backlog of um, appointments and people who've not been able to access for whatever reason. So that's in train. The reform part is the um, learning from what um, 
we have learned in terms of um, delivering services differently and I think we've already spoken to that in terms of video conferencing um, in order to take services forward but understand what we need to do and transform and develop in this in the ways that we already were doing prior to the pandemic and learning from the rapid changes that we've had to make and in that we're now in um, wave two um, which is um, current staffing. Um, we, you know, we are experiencing the increase as uh, across Nottinghamshire in terms of staffing absence. So um, the NHS has gone into level four. What we were doing prior to that is looking at our workforce plans to be able to recover, restore, recover and counter um, wave two. So we're in that at the moment. And we've got the plans that we need in terms of the uh, recruitment that we've been doing. And we're continuing to recruit now. So we've started some, some campaigns to be able to do that. Making sure that our bank workforce is healthy. We've collaborated on our bank where we can across systems. And we also um, have a, an agreement between um, our system partners as well. So. Um, Things are working well at the moment um, and our workforce planning um, continues. So it's it's live, it's current um, and operational now, but it's continued to move into the future in terms of ensuring that students are able to still learn and be able to um, come in and we can still recruit. So we've got that workforce in place ongoing. Um, I think it's a bit of a whistle stop tour. It's in the paper and I'd welcome any questions. Right, I've got Councillor Martin first, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that report. Um, <clears throat> the COVID and non-COVID Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust workforce loss from March 2020 to July 2020 has been calculated at around 7.4% including sickness, uh, isolation and shielding. Yes. Can, you, uh, can you split that between ordinary and COVID? Ordinary illness and, you know, general sickness and, and, and then what's attributed to COVID? Um, yes. Does the chairman now feel in res retrospect that the failure to have comprehensive testing programme for healthcare staff contributed to a higher level of absences during that period? News that Nottinghamshire will be one of the 66 areas where mass testing is to be rolled out is a concern. There remains concerns over the pilot in Liverpool. Anything designed to bring the R rate down is welcome, though. That said, any decision flies in the face of comments made yesterday by the Public Director of Health, Jonathan Gribben. He confirmed to me at the Health and Social Care meeting that Nottinghamshire had no intention to follow Liverpool's example of full testing. This was until the results of the Liverpool pilot are analysed. So we all know that the potential for harmful diversion of resources and public money is vast. And healthcare experts have looked carefully at the pilot in Liverpool and concluded that it was not really fit for purpose. Are we making a, are we going to keep making political statements or are we going to actually ask a question? Yeah, I'm getting there. Well, so, now let's get to the question. You've got, we've got health professionals here giving, yeah. up their, giving up their valuable time yeah. To answer questions on what we're doing in Nottinghamshire. Well, I asked Not you. Not for you to make your political that. point, so you can put your little blog on your on your website, say this is what you've done. Yeah, we're here as a non-political, apolitical group to ask questions about healthcare in Nottinghamshire. Not having a go at anybody, just asking oh, no. questions, genuine questions. Can you yeah. ask a genuine question, please? Yeah. Can you please? outline what physiological support trusts have uh, received and if we are properly supervising their working hours and what do you mean by appropriate breaks for the staff? Okay. Can, you, can you answer that please, Carol? So, um, uh, yes, we daily we are um, looking at our sick reps in terms of our staffing capacity of those staff that are off sick those staff that are off shielding and those that are on um who are off sick because of covid and those who are on precautionary measures i.e they've got to self-isolate so we do look at all of those figures um in detail um 
the last question in terms of um, support, psychological support, we do have um, many different support systems in staff, for staff in place, according to what they need. Um, so there are different levels of support um, and the staff are, are able to access them and that's what the support um, team are for. So they can have that initial conversation that will help direct them to the best um, resource for them. Um, we are also supporting um, our counterparts across the system with that resource as well. In terms of breaks, we do monitor working hours. Um, we do that across our um, staff who work bank, who work as our substantive staff. Um, and so we um, legally have to ensure that staff do have breaks. Um, we do monitor our staff's, um, our safe staffing levels as well. Yeah, because it's, it's well documented that frontline healthcare workers have high rates of mental health issues and probably will suffer post-traumatic stress among frontline medical workers, because that's happened yeah. in previous epidemics. You know, and additional anxieties that are going to be a result of, of, of the non-testing, which, you know, I don't believe we should be testing everybody, but it, it really does help if we can test the crucial NHS staff and doctors and teachers and key workers who are looking after public in general and that's that's my point really and it is a political meeting this and it, and it, the part nice. the object of it is to be scrutinized scrutinizing and i didn't ask the, i didn't ask the uh, the officer the political question i asked you the political question anyway so anyway i'll leave it at that right um so i've got kevin greaves next then please thank you chairman <clears throat> yeah i find the report uh very limited in detail you know I, I think it's something that well i find that's been rushed together and on a topic that's so important especially today uh, is is that mental health issues is absolutely rocketed and uh, you know and i thought there'd been a lot more detail in this report but sadly there's not um what i would say uh, or ask you uh, how many nurses have you now recruited? Because on uh, page 17 at the top there, uh, you seem to be relying on bank nurses quite a lot. And to me, this is a very expensive way of spending public money on bank nurses. And um, uh, how many how many of your staff were, were off work with the last, uh, uh, well, shutdown is what we had, and uh, how many now are unwell through COVID that you're having to replace through uh, through uh, uh, bank uh, bank staff? And obviously, uh, I imagine there'll be lots of them who are uh, are self isolating also. So is the is the pool of uh, is is the pool of nurses now uh, getting lower and lower? Thank you, Chair. Don't answer that, Karen. Yes, um, the, there's not a straight answer to that. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just working that through. So, in terms of nursing supply, yes, the pool of available nursing staff nationally is low and has been for some time. And before the pandemic, we were doing a lot of work to address that um, in the same way that all our counterparts are. We do rely on um, bank and agency, but we'd achieved a lot prior to the pandemic in terms of reducing um, the need for agency and using bank um, appropriately. However, we do still have a, a reliance on our bank um to cover um uh, currently um and prior to the pandemic we um are again looking at our recruitment campaigns the um now to be able to address that um and um, we are pleased to be taking advantage of the government work that's come through in terms of um, increasing the 
um, number of nurses nationally. So um, a lot of work's being done in Health Education England to help us with that. What we do know, the fruition of that is two to three years time, but that's not to negate the importance of that work. So we are at the moment, we're going out to recruit for apprentice nurses. We are topping, we are doing the top up degrees for um, nursing associates. We're also looking at how um, we can ensure that we retain a greater proportion of staff. Um, and um, th there are, th there are, nine or ten routes into nursing um, to be able to do that. So there's a lot of concentration on our strategic workforce planning now. Um, so that doesn't answer sort of the operational day to day that we have. Mm -hmm. um, well, the other part of what our response is looking at how other roles and how we can work differently to make sure that we are still delivering the care. In some cases, We've got, um, it doesn't need to be a nurse. It can be an allied health professional. Um, we have increased, we've um, increasing social workers into our mental, our community mental health teams. So there, there are many different ways that we've been, we've been looking at the gap and um, we are planning forward, but that was before pre-pandemic. Um, and we've worked through the pandemic in that same scenario, but we've managed to work with the staffing that we, we have. And, and I don't think I've answered all of your questions. Um, happy for you to restate some of them. Yeah, uh, well, numbers would be good through you, Chair. Uh, numbers would be good. That's why I was saying that uh, with this report that uh, it's very little in detail. There's not much to it. And uh, so can you give me uh, the numbers of nurses that you have recruited? I can, but not today, not, not at this moment in time. I think it'd be very helpful. Um, make sure I'm on mute. Yeah, I think it'd be very helpful for us to have those figures, and 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 when we come to any future future reports, to include those sorts of things in, because that will give the uh, committee members a better insight into the uh, <laughs> the difficulties you're facing, particularly in the recruiting side and and the retention. Yeah, so uh, uh, that would be very helpful. I'm sure Martin Gately will make sure all members get a get a copy of those of those figures. Is there anything else you want to highlight, Kevin? Uh, no, sadly, uh, those uh, those are my prime uh, questions of recruitment. And uh, yeah, but well, obviously you haven't got those numbers, so I'll have to leave it there, Chair. Thank you. OK, th thanks, Kevin. But we will get them. And then uh, if we feel necessary, we can always get this item brought back um, to, to scrutinise it, it, it closer. Yeah, I've got, Liz, I've got Liz Plant next, please. Chair, oh, sorry. Chair, sorry. Liz want to come in. Yeah, sorry, Chair, on that yeah, no, no worries. On that particular item, obviously, um, Carol's talking about the Mental Health Trust recruitment. Um, clearly, we are looking at, and we have part of our restoration plans, recognise that to do what we need to do in a COVID secure world, we are going to need more staff, not just in mental health and community services, but also acute services. So I think if we provide numbers, we will provide you numbers for our entire workforce, if that's OK. I think that'd be very helpful, actually, as long as it's departmentalised, so we so we can see where, where the weaknesses are. I think members will be content with that. Cause, and I yeah, not. yeah, because we, as much as anybody else, we don't want to rely clearly on agency staff, um, but we've got to we've got to have a plan to build the workforce that we need across the board, and there is some planning um, that, that is doing that. So we'll try and share you all that um, workforce data. Brilliant, thank you. I've got list plan next, then, please. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Plant, you're on mute. I must work these symbols out. It can't be difficult. Um, yes, uh, fully support what, what Kevin's just said. Um, um, and I think because um, it, it is crucial that we sort of do know, one, what the need is of the workforce going forward, and obviously how far we're actually getting to meet that need. Um, it does actually say on, in the, on page 15 of the yellow pages that um, a large scale recruitment programme using national and local return to work initiatives was obviously um, uh, undertaken. And uh, perhaps not now, but it, it's at some point in the future, it would have been, it would be helpful to know how successful that was. 
I mean, it does, I think you have mentioned that obviously retired staff came back into the uh, into the workforce, which, you know, take my hat off to them in terms of coming back at the most difficult time ever um, to actually, you know, get back in and, and get on with the job again is, is fantastic. So, yes, it would be helpful to have more on that. Moving to um, page 17, um, it uh, lists... The following services are on track for delivery against standards by the end of 2021. And there's quite a number of um, uh, services down there. Uh, I think, it, I suppose what I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised that they are on track. Um, and again, the Kevin's point is valid again, because perhaps more detail would have been helpful there. Um, because we all know that the need for mental health services has obviously increased across the board. And that must be obviously from low level need to quite high level need. Well, um, I think one of the things is uh, it says early intervention to the psychosis access. Well, that's obviously at the other end of the spectrum, really. Um, and then the last point says implementation of stabilise and bolster plans for community health teams. Um, so I'd like to know a little bit what is meant by that statement um, and, you know, in terms of how, well, basically how you've, uh, how it's, with, that, with the great, the increased need for those services, how you've actually managed to keep those mm. services on track, really. Mm. Thank you. There's two in I'm sorry, Pat, is it okay if I pick that up? Because actually that's the section of the paper yeah, yeah. that I'm going to cover next after um, Carol has finished on workforce um, to enable Carol to attend her other meetings. So um, if I pick those up in my section, if, if that's okay. You're on mute, Councillor Garling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now I've done it now, I've got the loose plant bug. <laughs> Right, <laughs> Muriel, can you ask your question, please? Oh, thank, well, just a, a comment and a question, Carol, thank you. Um, I'm re really glad to hear that there are more um, routes into nursing being developed. I think there was a kind of a sense that the only route became a kind of graduate route, which obviously has its strengths, but I think it's, I'm, I'm really encouraged from a lay person's point of view that uh, the, the apprenticeship route and so on are going to be encouraged because uh, there's such a wide range of skills needed in nursing that, um, yeah, I think that's really encouraging. And the other question was really going back to reiterate Councillor Martin's question about the health of staff, and particularly in terms of COVID testing. Um, I suppose it's in two parts from my point of view. Are you um, content with the level of testing that is available to staff at the moment? And have you picked up anything about what might happen after the Liverpool-focused um, testing? It might come to um, an area like Nottingham, which is obviously um, likely to go into um, a high tier after the current clampdown. Thank you. I'm... Um... In terms of work, uh, we're workforce planning and routes into nursing, I think it's a really exciting time with the different um, opportunities available for um, coming in and being a nursing. You know, we, we're looking at widening our access to healthcare assistants, how you develop as a healthcare assistant, and then you can apply to be a trainee nurse associate and, uh, um, you know, and train and train. Um, up um, as much as um, is suitable for for you so it really does widen our workforce and and that that diversity in our nursing workforce is is, is really key as well so yeah I'm, I'm, I echo your comments on that I think it's a really good time um, to ref um, and um, the, it's right that we've refreshed the way that um, we increase our workforce in terms of testing um it's it's hard to answer because um, we've we have been able to test our um, workforce, and um, as you can imagine, the the way that we've achieved that and the development of methodology across our system has changed quite rapidly over the time. But we've um, been able to adjust and organise to be able to ensure that our staff are communicated with. 
um, and have supported access to tests and get to results. So we run that seven days for our staff. I can't comment on what's happening in terms of staff testing. It's very new um, and I, I really that that's I, I don't have the detail um, and not to the extent that I could give you um, a, a valuable answer, unfortunately. OK, I think that, again, that's something that um, the committee would like to know about because that's important because, you know, I think I don't know if I'm echoing what the committee feel. It was my belief that, you know, you was losing, losing staff because of a sniffle and then you're losing them for 14 days. Whereas if they, if they get a sniffle and you test them, they got the results back within within a couple of days or a day, and then then you don't have to lose them. So it's you know it's, yeah. it's a lot more efficient, a lot more efficient way of, of maintaining your staffing levels by by having that level of of testing. Um, Apologies, um, I've probably not been clear. We are doing that. Um, so we do have um, we have a staff testing line and an email that our staff contact. Um, if there is an outbreak on a ward, we do it um, uh, uh, as a, the whole the whole um, team. And um, you, you you're absolutely right. You have a test, you get the result, you can be back to work or not. So there are various routes of management, and we are deploying that rapidly, and we have been able to throughout. Okay, thank you. Um, are you, are you access to, to labs changes, so yeah. you know we work with it. Lovely. Are you happy with that, Mayor? Then. Yes, I mean, obviously, we, are, we I think there's a national concern about in the in the first six months, the high level of uh, staff deaths. And we, we don't want to see that in the, the next six months, do we? No, absolutely not. Um, that, that brings us on then to Ajanta, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I was also talking about well-being of NHS staff report. Page two of the report says that staff who are at risk, there has been a risk assessment and there is an at-risk group and BAME staff. So uh, my question is that please can you elaborate on what support or what measures to mitigate this at-risk uh, group has now been put in place, if there has been any uh, uh, mitigation put in place. Um, the reason I am asking also is because uh, then the report follows on and makes the conclusion uh, that uh, uh, due to the pandemic, the, there are ongoing risks um, uh, for and to staff. So this is a concern if such risks are not mitigated for retention of uh, staff. And I echo what Muriel was saying, that we don't want uh, you know, any more uh, casualties of uh, staff. So my question is if there has been any mitigation. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, the risk assessments um, have evolved over the time, and we are using the national um, guidance on the risk assessments. So actually, it's improved in terms of the um, the outputs, and the um, and it it enables the conversation with managers and staff um, and, and more detailed conversation. Um, so we. It really, to, in terms of mitigations, it depends on what the risk assessment is saying. But we um, are um, putting in reason. We're putting we're putting in adjustments essentially to meet the needs of the individual and their work area. So we, if if a member of staff cannot ca continue in their current job, can they do alternate work? Can they work at home? Um, do it, you know, do they need a higher level or a different level of PPE? It's all very de dependent on the individual and we're supporting them with that. They they, they have had, uh, so staff have um, access to the staff support team to enable those conversations and occupational health. Um, so if they do, staff do need support with that conversation, it's very much there. And um, staff who are shielding or those who are taking what we're calling sort of extra precautionary care are also in contact with the staff support team and they, um, and so we, as part of that, asked for um, their risk assessments to be sent in 
so that, that they can be looked at and advised on in terms of the quality of the risk assessments, not just our risk assessments being done. So um, there are a number of different ways that we've um, sought to address um, this. We were at a point of most shielding staff being able to um, come back into work. Now, I know risk assessments isn't just about shielding, um, actually, so that is, I don't want to try and um, divert from the um, question. But um, we, we've, we've continued with the adjustments and um, what we've said with uh, wave two is to um, redo the risk assessments, have those conversations and look at what we need to do accordingly with each person. Does that answer your question? You're not looking happy, Ajanta. Is this, is this something else you want to ask? Um, it answers my question in part, it, 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 but it, the the mitigations, uh, you know, it's, uh, the hesitation from the answer. Am I? Maybe I'm picking up more than I need to. It feels that there isn't any clear mitigation. That look, this is the risk assessment, and if they're based on the outcome of risk, standard risk assessment, which is what you are saying, you're following national guidelines. Then are there standard mitigations, and are they put, or are, are they either? I hope it isn't just made up on the hoof, which I'm sure it isn't. Um, but yes, so I'd like to say that, you know, the mitigations need to be in place so that staff do feel because otherwise the next step will be retention of the staff. If this, yeah. the stress levels are very high and those who are at risk, there isn't enough mitigation, then yes, while the people are coming back, staff who are coming back out of retirement, uh, it's just not fair if there isn't enough uh, protection. So that's all. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's not on the hoof. Um, there are flow charts um, of different scenarios um, where staff um, may have difficulty working. Um, these are published for staff to look at as well as managers. So it might be that a member of staff's pregnant. It might be that they've got carer's responsibility. They may have... Um, it, it, so there, we've got um, a number of different scenarios set out and different options um, available to have a look at. Um, we've been communicating daily with staff um, and we've made the resources and information really visible for um, staff as well. Um, so it, it, it is set out, um, the mitigations are there and essentially there are a number of staff who haven't been able to work. But we're supporting them with that. And it, um, we just, what we're saying is not a fixed position because there might be some, it might change. And what we want to do is make sure that, you know, staff are engaged with that process. OK, you happy? Uh, lovely. I've got uh, Martin right now, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's been a long wait, but uh, I pressed my button a long time ago, but me, I'm only vice chairman. It doesn't matter, does it? Anyway, anyway, uh, moving a, on, moving it on. It was in order. Uh, <laughs> go away. Be a go bit away. quicker. Anyway, anyway, uh, mine less controversial, my, my, my comments and questions, and, 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 and Liz and uh, Kevin and the chair have already asked for more information regard, regarding recruitment. But I have I have got to say that I am impressed with the report's content as regards support for staff and Carol's answers into questions regard support to staff. And I congratulate Carol and the trust on, on what they're doing. Um, just touching on recruitment slightly, uh, what one of the pools of of, uh, of workforce that is available to you are people returning from work after retirement um, and, and I understand they they will ha be having great difficulty at the moment because they've had a working life working probably in, in mental health under much much different circumstances we didn't have a COVID crisis when they when these people retired they've been asked to come back into employment during extremely difficult times so can I ask Carol if she has any idea how these return to work people are, are coping with the extra pressure which they didn't have in their working life pre-COVID? And that's my question. Thank you. The 
the numbers of staff returned after retirement isn't vast um, and we found through the um, bring back staff scheme and this uh, I'm, I'm talking to Notts Healthcare specifically um, I think my acute colleagues have had a different experience um, but the, the, the what we need to take care of when we're returning an individual is what do you want to return to and um, what you know what do we need to be considerate of in your working environment and the way that you want to support so um, we we always encourage people to return pandemic uh, or non-pandemic um, because um, there is a wealth of experience that we can use and whether um, that we have the what we call legacy mentor scheme so if you um, if the amount of new qualified nurses that we have and I'm, I'm moving pandemic aside in our workforce and the amount of workforce that we have with a um, with um, a different experience to what a retired person has if we can return somebody to work that can mentor and support and help then that's a great job done and a great resource to us so um, we I think it's an, a case it's an individual by individual basis being really um, clear on what their parameters are and what they need to do. We, they would do the same mandatory training if it's dependent on how long they've been away from work um, and that would include your ability to do your hospital life support and um, your managing violence and aggression. Um, so, um, so I, I do know that um, you know we did have contact with people said I'm happy I'm, I'm, I am clinical but I, I can support you with back office functions um, as a returner. Um, the return to work um, model is still being continued and needs to be worked up and so we take took examples from other systems and what the work they're doing as well so it, it's work in progress as well because nationally I don't know if you've heard about the reservist model which um, we need to look into to see if that's something that is applicable and how we run that but that's a system-wide scheme as well and that's about um, workforce that could be available at times such as this and people that want to work in times such as this and are able to. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Carol. Okay. You're right, Vice Chairman. Is there anything else you'd like to ask? Well, while you're asking me, yeah. <laughs> there was one question, but I, I shall leave that. Thank you. Okay. Right. I, I'll, I'll do the summing up then, um, if, I, if I have no more hands are up. Um, I, I think, Carol, um, I think it's the first time you've presented to us. It is. Um, so I think you get the message that uh, the committee would like more detail in the report uh, so that they can have a better feel um, for what's actually going on on the ground. They're, they're very passionate uh, bunch of people, um, very, very ha you know, happy that they're in this committee um, asking the questions they do. I think, um, as, as Martin said, the vice chairman, it, you know, it's, it does look like the staff are getting a good level of support. Uh, there has been some um, concern shown about the sort of risk assessments and, and how that, that's operated. But I'd like, I'd like you to take something back from us, really, and I'm sure I'll see lots of nods here, it is to, not only just to thank the staff, but the staff that have come back, that used to work for the NHS and have come back, and I know some of them. Um, you know, they, 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 as soon as the request went out, they put the name forward, to come back and help and I think that's testament to them because they'd left you know um, but they re recognised they had skills that could be used by you so please would you make sure that you pass that thanks on from this committee to, to all those involved thank you I will chair and thank you for the opportunity to come lovely thank you right that now takes us on to item seven Chairman, I think Lucy Anderson wants to contribute next on this. Oh, sorry, oh, we haven't finished, have we? Sorry, sorry, Lucy. That's I'm, okay. I'm, I'm happy oh, it's to all move on to item seven. <laughs> it's all this um, two and three. Go on Sorry, Lucy. Okay. Um, I know Carol's item has obviously generated quite a lot of discussion. Um, and as I said, I'll um, cover some elements around performance and service transformation and how some of that's been impacted by COVID as well. Um, so I think just to set some context, I think um, members will be aware of the five year forward view for mental health that was published in 2016. And that did absolutely introduce the most comprehensive set of standards for mental health services, I think that really has ever been in place. 
um, and it is also being reflected in the long term plan and delivery of the standards within the long term plan for mental health is underpinned by investment. Now, um, I think members did rightly so point out that actually there is still um, quite a lot of work to do to improve mental health services and um, the investment and the objectives within the long term plan do actually run up to 2023-24. So the standards that it covers, they range from perinatal children and young people services through to reducing out of area placement. So it is obviously quite vast and comprehensive. Um, in Nottinghamshire, um, we um, have had significant service development and improvement, which has actually been underpinned by um, delivery plans that have been um, developed by partners across the system. Um, I think it is really important just to underline where we were in March. We had really robust plans in place. Um, and um, in March following guidance that came down from government, um, the majority of mental health services moved to a phone or video conference and delivery model, um, as has already been picked up earlier in the presentation. However, and I think what's really important is if um, a face-to-face -face appointment was required, it was facilitated. And I think that is particularly important for services like crisis resolution and home treatment, um, which is an evidence-based model that will provide an urgent service for patients um, and intensive support if needed um, as an alternative to hospital admission. Um, within the paper, we have outlined the services that are on track to meet national standards by the end of 2020-21. Um, but I think it is probably important to point out again, as I said at the beginning, that often these plans run to 2023-24. So these are, are some interim standards. But just to highlight the areas where um, we are achieving in Nottinghamshire, one of those is early access um, to early intervention to psychosis services, um, which means that a patient will start treatment within two weeks. Um, and also funding to ensure that staff ratios in crisis resolution and home treatment teams are at recommended levels. And we'll pick up a bit more on that in the report that is due to come to the committee in December. Um, there was a question earlier about the plans um, to, uh, it's the national term that's used to stabilise and bolster community teams. And that really is around um, getting some more capacity into community mental health teams to enable them then to move on to um, transformation, but also to introduce some new roles um, within to those teams. And I think part of this is because it's been recognised nationally and I think also locally that there has been some underinvestment in those services and the plans to improve will run up to 2023-24. I think it's probably important to also highlight some positive developments that have actually been expedited due to COVID. Um, and these include um, the implementation of an open access all age 24 seven urgent mental health line um, where a patient is able to um, make contact and will actually um, have access to and be assessed by a qualified nurse. Um, and we also underpin that by a mental health helpline, um, which can provide some um, support as well if um, a patient isn't in urgent or, or crisis. Um, with regards to the mental health support teams in schools, which um, we picked up earlier, um, the first services were introduced um, in December 2019, and that was in Nottingham, North and East and Rushcliffe. Um, Mansfield, Nashfield and Nottingham City is due to come online this month and Newark and Sherwood and Nottingham West um, will start training in January and then will be fully operational um, by January 2022. Um, I think it is really important to highlight that there are risks to delivery in all areas, but there are recovery plans that are in place. Um, and one of the areas that has been impacted by COVID is primary care psychological therapies or IAPT access rates. Um, we, ha we have had some discussion on this earlier. Initially, um, referrals had um, reduced. They were down 44% in quarter one compared to the three months prior. However, referrals have started to increase and performance against the standard has improved. Um, I think another important area is also um, patients with severe mental illness because we know they're at greater risk of physical ill health and an average die 15 to 20 years earlier um, than the general population. And to try and improve this, there is a standard to um, increase the number of physical health checks for patients to ensure that they are um, then referred to receive treatment. 
And since March, performance in this area has declined as the majority of checks were undertaken in primary care. However, um, there are a number of actions that are taking place, but just one to highlight is um, recruitment of health improvement workers um, who will work within some of the secondary care teams and also across primary care to ensure the checks are undertaken and then um, services are accessed to help improve that. Um, as, as highlighted in the paper, there are um, service transformation plans um, in Nottinghamshire and we are continuing to implement those to improve service delivery um, and more importantly patient outcomes. Um, as I have mentioned there is an item that is coming to the committee in December um, on crisis services um, but if there are any specific um, questions on, on anything that's within the paper or anything that I've, I've covered I'm happy to take those now. I've got Muriel, got your hand up, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Lucy, for that. Uh, mine's a bit of a broad, <clears throat> a broad question. Um, I think for historical and cultural, well, historical reasons, the mental health services have become divided between the local authority and the health trust. Um, with different functions, but overlapping functions. And I know we can't, it's a bit like saying, if you know, we wouldn't start here if we wanted a kind of integrated <laughs> service. Uh, and we can't, you know, there's no point in blaming people for that. But can you see the, um, cause I think it's still confusing uh, and the issues about partnership working. And I mean, there are good aspects, some things are working well, but some feel some aspects feel either duplicative or um, fragmented. Do you? What would you like to see happening through ICS to to make mental health services more coherent across the uh, the local authority and uh, the trust? Um, I, I think that's a really good question. Food for thought, definitely. I think, um, in my opinion. We, there have been some really good developments um, around crisis and urgent care services. So um, crisis services, the street triage model that we have um, in Nottinghamshire, they are pure partnership um, models. They couldn't have been done by one organisation or agency alone. I think one of the challenges that we have is um, around community mental health transformation. However, that is absolutely recognised locally and nationally that that is more than just NHS services. So um, we are currently working through um, community transformation plans and we will receive some additional national funding to implement that. But one of the key criteria is about local, author local authority involvement in that, VCS um, involvement. So kind of recognising that it's broader than just NHS services. In fact, they're probably a really small part of it. So I think maybe um, some of the things that have been undone historically have realised that that actually hasn't really benefited people who access services. So um, it is, as I said, a three year programme um, that we will work through to um, integrate and, and put some of those um, service developments in place. Oh, just Are we in the first year of that plan then? Uh, so um, what we're currently in, what's it's being classed as nationally is to stabilise and bolster, and that's been very much focused around community mental health teams. But then moving on from April, it is um, to increase um, VCS delivery and also um, the interface between local authority and um, health services. Oh, thank you. So it'd be good in a year or so to hear how that's going, wouldn't it? So we, as councillors, we can uh, yeah. be supportive of it. Okay, yeah. yeah, of course. That's a good time scale to work to, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Look, thank, thanks for that, Mira. A great, great question. Great question. And, and, and if we had that elusive blank piece of paper, I don't think we'd write anything the way anything's been no, written, no, no. whether that be the NHS or local government, to be fair. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, well, one day, one day, just put me in charge for a year, I'll sort of Liz. Hello. Yes, ah. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, yes, thanks for that, Lucy. That, that was helpful. Um, again, I'm just looking at uh, children and young people's mental health access. And it's this sentence. 
Additional mental health support teams in schools and new services are operational from September, October 2020. Now, I'm obviously, um, I'm a, not obviously, I'm a Rushcliffe councillor and I'm um, a governor at a local school. And I do know that our school, I was talking to the head teacher a couple, well, about a month ago, I think, on um, uh, some issues. And um, this support came up because I knew that we were part of the Pathfinder or whatever. Um, so I, I would just like, and not necessarily now, um, just to have a little bit more detail on what that support actually entails and how it works across schools. Okay. Or, um, and obviously, again, uh, I mean, she was very pleased, the head teacher was, in terms of the support. And obviously, uh, the parents whose child had had the support have been very, very pleased. Um, and it really is crucial that obviously, if this is working, that it is rolled out across the whole of the county. Um, and that all schools and all children have access to that. So, you know, if I could have that information at another time, that would be great. Yeah, that's Thanks. fine. I think that's really positive feedback and, and we could absolutely provide some further detailed information. Right, I don't have any more hands up. Thank you very much for that, Liz. So you're going you're to come back in a year. <laughs> probably before then on other things but in a year to tell us how how that's all going and, and how it's worked and um what what the issues were uh, i'm looking forward really i'm looking forward to seeing how that can improve the services really because we do know there's that sort of disconnect between um between the uh, local councils and and the nhs not for anybody's fault just by the bureaucracy of everything so anything that can make that a lot better would be great. I've got Lucy just wants to come in on this. Actually. Sorry, Lucy, Lucy sorry, Pat. sorry, Chair, it's not on this. It's before we move to the next agenda items, if that's OK. Apologies. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. OK. So, say that again, sorry. Sorry, it's not on this matter. It's just before we move to the next agenda items. OK, then. That's thank brilliant. You. OK, so, so, yeah, thank you very much for coming. I think that's the first time you've been to us as well, isn't it? Thank you. Yes, it is. But I yeah. am here next month as well. So, uh, yeah. Well, you'll get used to us then. Look, look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you very much Thank for you. what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Go on then, Lucy. You want to come in on yeah, something? Yeah, sorry. We've got some. Um, so I think we're due to do tomorrow's NUH next and then Chatsworth. Um, yeah. We just got the benefit of having Becky Sutton, the new director of nursing for Knott's Healthcare, and also Catherine Pope, clinical director um, and a rehab specialist or uh, AHP specialist in the meeting till one so i wondered could we could we do chatsworth next um mm -hmm. and pick up tomorrow's nuh at the end and anybody the against anybody against that speak now for a word of peace okay then we'll, we'll go on to that then okay the report provides the latest update on chatsworth rehabilitation ward at kingsmill hospital lucy dadge is joined by a ccg colleague Stephen. did you say Stephen smith i don't think you did, did i you? did yeah Oh, yeah, yeah, and, well. and Becky Sutton, uh, Catherine Pope from Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust in updating <coughs> the committee. So if you want to lead on then, Lucy, please. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a very quick overview. Um, hopefully colleagues will remember that I um, hope I came with you on the journey um, from when Sherwood Forest um, uh, made it clear that they were unable to run this facility as a bedded level three rehab um, and, and that that case was made. Um, we went through a public consultation. The committee were extremely helpful in making sure that we had properly reflected the views of the public. Um, and as you know, as we went through that process, the responsibility for delivering the service handed over to Nottinghamshire Healthcare with a, an end game of developing a community-based service um, that would be offer, confer greater benefit than the bedded service. Um, but we always said that before we made any permanent change, we would come back to this committee to give the committee the um, appropriate level of assurance, if we could, um, that we understood, fully understood the health need, that we had an appropriate care model um, and that we were ready to make that change. As you know, through the first agenda item around restoration, in the immediate interest of clinical safety, the ward was closed very early on in the COVID um, uh, wave one. Um, and today we want to update you on what we see as the next steps. So I think um, I think what's going to happen is that Stephen is going to give an overview. And I think colleagues from the Healthcare Trust, who are the provider of the service, are going to talk to you about um, where we really are with this and how their staff are working with us. So with that, I'm going to hand over, I think, to Stephen first. Is that right? Before, yes. 
Before you do, Lucy, as part of this item, if yeah, if you could also bring in about Lindham Lodge, because we can't we yeah. can't add, we can't add an item. No, yeah, no. I did brief the committee earlier yeah. that, that you will be talking about yeah. um, our recommendation on that. So yeah. at so that's some probably, point, bring yeah. that in. If we could do that at the end, Keith, because that's particular yeah. that just needs to come from me and other colleagues may 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 need to go before then. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. No problem at Thank all. you. Thank you. Um, there is a slide deck that has been circulated. Is it is it easy if I just put that up on screen? Yeah. Is that is that is that visible? Yeah. Thank you. OK, so, um, yeah, as, as Lucy's just um, summarised um, some of the background to this, um, just do a, a, a another brief recap. So, yes, it was a um, it is a war that is is. Uh, within Mansfield Community Hospital. Um, it was a, previously a 16-bedded neuro rehab ward delivered by Sherwood Forest Hospitals and transferred to Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust on February 1st, 2019, following patient engagement and work across a number of key stakeholders. Um, when that transfer was made, as Lucy referenced, the, the, it did re reduce down to eight beds. And as part of that movement across, the feasibility of moving to a community-only model um, would be developed and tested. Um, so, so since the NHT took on the contract, they have obviously began to make progress with developing the community model. And this has been done by trial and initiatives that are detailed further in the briefing paper, but included things like weekend leave trials. So patients were able to go home at weekends and receive required input from home. And, and, and a daycare offer. So patients receiving much of the care from home, but coming into the ward weekly for some therapy. Um, as again, as Lucy's referenced, the testing of the community offer has then been further accelerated by COVID. So following national guidance and local discussion, it was agreed that it was safer for this cohort of patients to be discharged from the acute setting. And NHT has safely discharged all patients um, home and are caring for them within their own homes. Um, NHT colleagues may say more, but I just wanted to note that the patient feedback over this period has been, um, been really positive. In terms of engagement to date, um, so, so like I said, whilst I've only been more involved uh, recently, I do know that these developments have been to um, the Health Scrutiny Committee a number of times. Um, so I just want to talk us through the steps that we've taken as a, as a group working across commissioners and providers to provide assurance that we've considered the key aspects in our proposal. So really thinking about the patient access, impact in terms of quality and the quality and, and how these developments will deliver improved outcomes for residents in Nottinghamshire. So we, we did set up a working group um, and we've been looking to develop a robust service model and specification and looking to mobilise a community only model by no later than the end of this financial year. There have been some key engagement processes that I just want to talk through and how we've we took the learning from them and how we've used them to inform this model. So in terms of the public engagement, um, in the briefing paper, there is there is the eight key themes that were, were drawn out of that are, are detailed in full, but we've really consolidated these into three key principles. So really ensuring the access to the service was important, and um, that the services should be of high quality, and, it, and the service should be delivered by an MDT with expertise in your rehab. And absolutely can say these are themes that we've had in the forefront of our minds when we've developed the service specification. So, for example, we will mandate within the contract that all therapy and nursing leads should have a significant experience and skills in neuro rehab. We've also completed the joint evaluation between NHT and commissioners, and this was completed in December 2019. Um, the report evaluated the initiatives that were trialled um, by NHT. Um, and has also summarised some work in terms of what's what's taking place with other key stakeholders. Um, one of the key points I just want to highlight from this report was that, this, that the subsequent community model need to make, needed to meet the needs of all patients that are accessing the inpatient service. So this is something that we've ensured as clearly we can't, these changes can't create a commissioning gap. So from the outset, we've worked on, all, on the principle that all patients that met the criteria for the ward-based service will be able to access the community-based service. And we've put in mitigation to ensure that we can deliver that. For example, an issue we'd need to overcome was for patients that would need access to the ward for specific equipment. And to ensure that we can still do this, we've, we've 
we put pathways in place that will ensure that rehab equipment uh, can be accessed to ISOLs um, within the patient's home. I just wanted to finally say about the, our, our work on, on the EQIA. So this has been completed and gone through CCG governance. Um, but it, it did highlight work that needs to be done, that there were clear pathways into the new community model. Um, so, and that work is um, that what that work's been undertaken with secondary care providers to ensure we've clarified what patient group are eligible, um, and and put in process so that provider provider discussions can be take place if required. Um, I'll just hand over now to Catherine, who talked through the service model in more detail and the benefits it will deliver. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about some of the main changes to the model, which. Um, we're really pleased because we believe this is going to really improve the service that we can offer to patients with, you know, some um, quite um, life affecting neurological conditions. So this will um, this change will allow us to have a um, much uh, broader range of therapists who are able to deliver neuro rehabilitation to people in their own homes and um, in, instead of where before people would just be admitted to a short time, now we can provide a service up to um, 12 weeks. And also what we will allow is people to be referred back in as, as their condition changes. So with a lot of these conditions, you'll know that people may have a series of um, relapses and remissions, such as something like uh, muscular sclerosis or they may have a rapidly deteriorating condition such as motor neurone disease. And this will allow us to be able to come back in as soon as there's a change and without the um, people having to go back through some sometimes quite lengthy pathways to get readmitted to a service where we already know them and, and they know their needs quite well. Um, it will be delivered in the patient's home. So that means um, it will be um, we'll be providing rehab in their normal environment and able to overcome the challenges that they meet in in their everyday life and trying to access um, activities in that with their family and local community. And um, and if their normal residence is a care home, we'll also be delivering exactly the same um, level of care there as well. Um, I think it's one of the really good things in developing this service is we've been able to look at other models and the evidence and in developing this model, which had a lot of clinical involvement, but it's also very strongly based on the um, clinical Senate guidelines to commissioners about what best practice looks like. So this is a, a, a really um, good service that the people of mid knots will be able to access. Can you put the last the next slide up, please, Stephen. Thank you. So this is a summary of the benefits and um, and some of the risks that we've noted. So as I've said, the the um, care will be delivered in the patient's normal residence, so there'll be no need to people to travel. And for some people um, with um, these types of conditions, that can be a um, really uncomfortable process in itself that negates any value of rehabilitation because they're so exhausted from the effort of getting to where they need to be. We'll be able to provide a quicker service for people and we'll be able to see many more people for longer than we ever could in an inpatient setting. And because we're now not having to deliver round the clock inpatient care, we've been able to um, increase the therapy staffing that will be available. Because we're not seeing people in hospital, that reduces um, the likelihood of them um, getting any other conditions. So obviously at the moment that that would be, we're most likely thinking of COVID, but obviously people who are in inpatient care are at greater risk of um, um, gain, gaining a lot, a lot of other quite nasty infections and sometimes life-threatening infections in themselves. So we think that this will provide better clinical outcomes for a larger cohort of patients. What we're mindful of is that there were some patients who were accessing the inpatient provision. And as Stephen has said, all those who meet the criteria that was set 
for that inpatient provision will be able to be seen in the community. But there's a small number of patients who really should be accessing better inpatient um, rehabilitation care than, than we we're, were ever able to offer at Chatsworth. So um, these are now being uh, referred to the what's called level 2B provision at Linden Lodge. And that means that not only do they have the access to um, therapy and nursing, but they also have um, medical access and, and a much more intensive rehabilitation that's appropriate for their needs. So I think the final slide is just a summary of what we've said. Um, we, we believe this is a really positive development. It means that people in mid knots will be able to get the same standard of care as those with similar conditions in the rest of the county and in the region. And so if um, subject to your approval, we'll be looking to undertake the um, change that's necessary within our service so that we can deliver it fully early next year. And uh, I think we're all very happy to take any questions. Lovely, thank you. I will now open the floor up. I've got um, just slightly in front of my uh, vice chairman was Muriel. Hello, Muriel. <laughs> Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you both for um, uh, your presentation. And I, I appreciate that it is well thought out and well argued. However, I think it's um, in terms of timeliness and balance. I think it's it's too high a risk, uh, and it does concern me. We had um, a presentation early this morning um, in another context about stroke. A service for people with strokes and uh, there was there was general agreement that the early support for people with strokes is is of uh, incredibly high quality in our county uh, but the um, the guy speaking to it acknowledged that actually where things do um, fall away is when people are returning home I can see there's been a good level of satisfaction from people who are at home at the moment who have been on the ward uh, because they've had the ward experience. Um, but it does concern me that I don't think the challenges of COVID and so on and hospital infections are really a strong argument for closing uh, a, a, res a, a bedded unit. And I think across most service user groups, there does seem there does need to be a residential element. I mean, for example, in adult social care, there's a huge move to um, home care, community support. But at the at one end, the local authority wants to ensure that there is high quality residential care. It might get smaller and smaller. But, and it needs to be high quality, but you do need the mix. And it, it just seems to me that we're, um, we're closing something that is a very key, it's not, it, it isn't, it, it's in, in your um, rating, it's 2B, isn't it? And it hasn't got all the uh, services that one, one would expect in a, a higher rated unit, but it, it, is, it is a very significant, uh, residential contribution to uh, to rehab. Um, I think are there various things that concern me. I mean, the issue about equipment, um, some equipment certainly can be used at home. Uh, sometimes people are overwhelmed by new equipment. Sometimes equipment sits there and isn't used. Um, I, th I, th I think I think if we're losing the balance of uh, a bedded unit and uh, community resources, we're, at this point in time when uh, Linden might be closing, when we don't know what the capacity and effectiveness is going to be of the new rehab centre, I just think this is not the time to do this. And, and we, we need to keep the balance of uh, some in-house support as well as all the benefits of support in the community. Because the other, I suppose the other broad thing, and it might not be relevant to what you're planning, but I've worked through the experience of mental health establishments, hospitals closing, 
and the funding not going into quality community care, but just kind of going to uh, serve other budgets. And uh, yeah, it just it just really concerns me. Thank you, Chair. Do you want to come back on that, um, Catherine? Um, well, I do. I do understand what you're saying, Muriel. But I think um, I suppose first of all, perhaps we weren't clear that we haven't. This this whole change isn't just about a response to COVID. The the reason the ward is already closed is because of COVID. What what that has enabled us to do is actually to undertake some assessment of whether this is actually going to work ahead of finally implementing the change. And I think um, we're, we're, we are really convinced it is. It enables us to provide a much better level of care to more patients than we ever can when we're providing an inpatient model because you know only eight patients can access an inpatient model at any time and then there's only a limited amount of outreach available for those patients to enable their discharge home this means we can see more people for much longer and as their conditions change the 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 pe I, I absolutely agree with you that there needs to be inpatient provision as well for the patients who meet the criteria for that care. And I, I appreciate there are other things going on at the moment about where that provision of care is going to be. But it's more important, I think, that people can access the right care for their needs in the right place to provide that at the right time than, than we keep something open that, that, that falls between two stalls and doesn't really meet uh, make the right contribution for either set of patients. I don't know if commissioners want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think Lucy, Lucy Dodge wants to come in on that. You, you're on mute, Lucy. Yes. Yeah. No, I I do I do very much recognise and empathise with Councillor Wise's well thought out concerns that we're closing something that was tangible, um, and we're dispersing resource just. One thing I would say, and it, it kind of rolls into the Linden Lodge, the issue with um, Chatsworth initially was it never was a level 2B unit. It was yes, it risked sense. taking level 2B patients, but it didn't have the, the essentially the medical right. leadership that it needed to care for patients in a level 2B setting. So I think your point about Linden Lodge is absolutely right, and I totally accept that. So when we we when we determined that having done all our sort of um, demographic analysis that we didn't think that we needed to commission or could safely commission a 2B unit from Mansfield, we gave you an absolute assurance that those patients would be treated at Linden Lodge, and I and that you need to be assured that those patients that need level 2B inpatient care will get that. So that links to Linden Lodge NRC, which I can pick up. So um, please be assured if people need bedded capacity, they will get it. Talk about Linden Lodge um, separately. In terms of dispersal of resource, again, um, we are absolutely committed to um, ensuring that the resource that Knotts Healthcare have to develop that community neuro rehab service stays there. We have a contract with them, we have KPIs, uh, you know, they have no desire to dissipate that resource and we certainly have no uh, intention of of letting that happen. So I, I understand your concerns and, I'm, and I think when we've talked about chats with them, I'm happy to pick up Linda Lodge more generally so we don't lose those patients. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come back on anything, Muriel? No, no. I see what other people say as well. No, it's okay. Fine. Martin Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I find myself entirely in support of what Muriel <laughs> said. Um, and I feel also disappointed that we've, we've, we've come from 2017 when the Chatsworth Ward was going to be closed without doubt, no, no ifs and buts to July 2018, when we were guaranteed permanent beds at Chatsworth. And, and, and now, because of COVID, um, Chatsworth has had to be closed. There was no to, two ways about that. I mean, there no, could no, be no argument. And now I, I feel that it's, that opportunity is being used by 
uh, the CCG to to finally put the nail in the coffin of, of Chatsworth. And as already been said, that there will be cases with when people have relapses of MS and quite nasty that is, and also deterioration of um, MND. But don't worry, there's, there's always a bed for you at Linden Lodge. So if there's a bed at Linden Lodge, we, people in North Nottingham, she don't want a bed in Linden Lodge. They want a bed closer to home. They want a bed at Mansfield Community Hospital. They want a bed in, in Chatsworth Ward and receive their treatment, if necessary, locally. Um, and I do agree that an outreach service for people needing less rehabilitation is a good idea. Well, let, let's try and operate the same side by side. Uh, I know money is tight. Uh, it, it'll always be tight. But the service has got to be there for those who need it. And I don't really think that sending people from could be as far as workshop, Mansfield, to Linden Lodge, to 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 a place which the, the NHS, as I already said, isn't fit for purpose. It's deteriorating. Yeah. We need the new National Rehabilitation Centre. That's years down the way. So what will happen when Linden Lodge does close? Will people with MS just be left? Or, or will they be have to have um, community treatment? It's I'm, I'm quite annoyed about it. And, and uh, I'm a politician who, who, who wears his heart on his sleeve. And I'm very disappointed that we've come to this. Um, I don't know what Lucy... Or, or Catherine can say to to appease me. I do know you've got the best intentions of the NHS, but I've got the best intentions mm. of the people of Mansfield. Thank no, you very I'm, much. So, so just sorry, Catherine, just from my perspective, can I assure all the councillors that I we haven't um, we haven't used COVID as an opportunity. Um, where we left it, I think when I we certainly we last came was that we said that that we would go down to eight beds and that when we felt that we could safely provide that care in the community, we would come back to you. I, but I, 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 you know, I completely understand your sentiment. I and I, I, I absolutely understand why you would like to keep bedded uh, facilities close as close to home as possible. I suppose what we have to do when we work with our clinical colleagues and our experts in this field is take their advice about what is the most effective and safe way and it's not this isn't a money decision at all you know we are spending money on neuro rehab for the same patient cohort but I'm sorry Catherine just hand over to you. No, no, I, uh, before, before you answer Catherine I've just got something just to add in there because like, like the rest of them, I, I've got great concerns about this um, you said about the eight beds. Do we, what was the, what was the um, occupancy of those eight beds before pre-COVID? Um, well, at the point that um, we looked to close the ward, we had four patients in the beds, so that was fifty percent. It hadn't been full for a significant period of time. That I think. So as a so I'm a therapist myself, and I and I do I do absolutely understand what you're saying because in an ideal world, we we would have everything for everybody, and the new centre would be right in the middle of Nottinghamshire and easily accessible. But that isn't that isn't the real world. So all I can say to you is that the patients that we will be seeing who in this care they they don't need inpatient care. What they need is more rehabilitation over a longer period of time than they're able to receive in an inpatient setting. The, patient, the patients who need inpatient rehabilitation shouldn't have been getting that from Chatsworth anyway. They should have been going to Linden Lodge and hopefully in the future to the, to the new centre. And I think that's borne out why less and less people were in Chatsworth, because it, it wasn't for most people with the conditions that we're talking about. It's it's much better for them and their preference to 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 be at home wherever that's possible. Do you want to come back, Martin? No, thank you. OK, Councillor Martin, please. <coughs> yeah. Well, before I make any corroborating statements containing my rationale behind my questions, the definition of scrutiny 
is searching, examination, minute or inquiry. And I'm not going to apologise for doing the job I was elected to do. And this is a typical example of scrutiny where in the past we scrutinised this whole issue. We took the time out to go to Mansfield Chatsworth uh, Hospital Ward and see for ourselves. And I remember the, the outcome of that was a very, very happy day in the Health and Scrutiny Committee a couple of years ago. Um, where we agreed, Lucy, that um, we wouldn't be calling it a neuro rehabilitation because it wasn't fit for purpose. It wasn't able to achieve that aim. Mm. And also that we were going to reduce the numbers of beds down from 16 to 11, which has now gone to eight. And then as a result of COVID, we've now gone to none. So, yeah, I hear what you, your experts are saying, that care in, <laughs> home, care in home and care in the community is, is going to be very advantageous to a lot of the patients that you treat for neuro rehabilitation at the level that you're delivering it at. And that's the crux of the matter, because the Chatsworth Ward wasn't able to deliver it at a higher level than 3B. Mm. So Linden Lodge was put up to deal with those who required higher level 2B. So I understand the rationale behind it. I think what I would want to what I would want to hear you explain more about is how you're going to treat those people with debilitating illnesses like motor neuron and like um, MS. You know, and <clears throat> it's, it's a finite balance because people don't come into a hospital requiring neuro rehabilitation. It's, a, it's an evolved pathway, how they get there. So what, what, what you're actually saying to us, and this is what we probably need to hear from the experts is, is it actually the reality nowadays that you're the way you deal with the patients is different to when this ward was first conceived. Mm. And that that defines the level of and direction of the care. Um, so, yes, I am not a clinical expert in this field. I But what I can tell you is when we did the original um, consultation and thank you for reminding me because it was it. Well, I felt it was a you know, an exercise of scrutiny in action. And hopefully we demonstrated that we were willing to consider and review our plans. What I did, what I did do at the time, and I don't know whether Catherine's got any more history than this than I have, that I um, talked to some of the staff on the ward who, as you remember, were really concerned at the time about Sherwood Forest's decision to, to yeah. withdraw this service. And what I was told at the time was actually the service was set up over 25 years ago and it wasn't actually a commission service. It was a service that evolved and it was a step up service at that point. So it was it was it was um, and Catherine, you might be able to elucidate from your clinical perspective, but it was it was filling a need for patients that were becoming unstable at home you know, with exacerbating symptoms of their longer term neurological. And it was almost a respite type facility where people could step up and then step out again. And I think what's happened in that period of time, Councillor Martin, if this is something you want us to come back, I'm sure we could, is that we've recognised that, again, that's not the right model of care. What we want to, but what we do need to get right is what Dr Simmons said, who is an acute physician who only sees the acute episode is making sure that when people step down from being acutely ill in a stroke that they are then properly supported in the community so I think you, you I'm answering I hopefully I'm answering your question which is yes it was a step up model what we need now need is a continuous rehab pathway um, that is based on keeping people in their own homes um, for um, as much of that care as we possibly can and I recognise this is more than about stroke. This is about other long term neurological disorders. Before you come back, Councillor Martin, is it, does any, any of the other two want to add into this? What, what, what Lucy said in terms of response? Well, only that because um, we'll have um, more staff out in more patients' homes, um, what I would expect is that we would. Um, pick up if people were deteriorating long before they got to the point that a hospital mm. admission was necessary mm. so that you know so that and I think that um, yes absolutely the the travel the direction of travel for a long time has been to avoid admitting people for for long periods of rehab where where it isn't necessary for them to be an inpatient but I did just want to say that you know I'm, I'm 
thank you about what you said about chats within the staff because I I agree with you. I don't, I I think it's one one of the best group of staff that I've ever had the privilege of working with. They really work in a a proper multidisciplinary patient centered way and one of the really important things to all of us the you know, us and the staff, is that we manage to keep that going in a community setting. Okay, Councillor Martin, do you want to come back? Yeah, I do actually. I think um, upon reflection from the councillors, and I speak for councillors from Ashfield and Mansfield here, uh, the Chatsworth Ward has always been highly valued and it's always been an excellent service and that's why we are sticking our neck out and saying, please don't close it off completely until you're sure you've got it right. And that's the main thing. Because uh, there's always going to be the misconception and the, and the rumour mill saying that they shut it because of money. But what I want to hear is that you are capable, once you've followed this pathway and closed it down, that you are capable of managing the level of care that people will require, even when Linden Lodge gets affected by um, the new rehabilitation centre, the main one down in Melton. Um, you know, we, we need to be assured that we're not going to lose that service provision. That's that's the main thing. I know that Shield Forest Trust wanted to shut it down in the first place, and that's why we stepped in and there was a big hoo-ha about it. And we came we came out with an evolved joint process and, and I thought the answer was very good. But now we're going a stage further and closing it off completely. So what I would like to be assured of from the Sherwood Forest Trust hospitals or Mansfield community or Lucy is that should certain people need to be hospitalised for a short period of time, that they are capable of doing that in Mansfield. Because <laughs> once, once Linden Lodge's numbers reduce because of the new centre that opens down in Melton Mowbray or wherever it's called, then, then it's going to be even further than Linden Lodge. Mm. So, uh, just, just, for, just for clarification, the new rehabilitation is in Nottinghamshire? Yeah. in Leicestershire, so you know, it, you know, you could you could put it as far away as you like, and it I'll isn't the bottom of the county. But, 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 but I get your point. But it isn't Melton Mowbray; it is Nottinghamshire. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can answer that, Lucy. Yeah, I do, and I'm obviously again. <laughs> I would like to bring Catherine in because the the people who were looking after these patients and 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 who um not healthcare took under their wing, um at the end of the last consultation, um are at the core of this so um the purpose of today's meeting was to share with you that we feel jointly as commissioners and as the clinicians that we've reached the point where we can give you the assurance that patients can be better not just safely but better managed in their own homes to avoid exacerbations of um, illness and also should they have had a hospital episode and the reason we come today is because what I understand Catherine and teams want to do is to start to talk to the staff because obviously it's quite an uncertain time for the staff so we talked about staff a lot in today's meeting so some of these staff have had to be redeployed you know they want to know that they've got a future in neuro rehab in the service that they they love and they have got skills in they want to feel that they know that you know at a fixed point that's what they'll be doing and that we've got this new model and it's going to work so that's why we've come today so I just want to to explain that to you it's about securing this this workforce so they understand where we're going um it's hard to talk about this without talking about Linda Lodge but your question sorry Councillor Martin about if patients need an in an inpatient episode will they go to Mansfield Absolutely, yes. You know, Mansfield is an acute hospital. If a patient has a, you know, a, a swallowing issue or something that needs acute hospital care, then of course they will have, they will get treated in Nottingham. But they don't want to be. They want to avoid that. This, this, this patient group want to avoid acute hospital um, episodes. Okay. Thank, thank you for that, um, Councillor Woodhead. Thank you, Chairman. It's been quite interesting listening to this uh, debate, really, because I, too, fought for Chatsworth Ward to stay at the community hospital. I saw firsthand how a patient at King's Mill that couldn't do anything other than move his eyelashes was transferred to Chatsworth Ward at community hospital and within three weeks was walking. That couldn't have happened without Chatsworth Ward 
at the community hospital. The services that were provided were 100% excellent. The physiotherapy they received was as and when they needed it themselves. They could ask for the physio on the ward and it was there. You cannot provide that service in anybody's home. That just is not possible to me to see that being happening. And if, if you really want to close the ward while well, you stop referring people to it, we all understand that happens. And people are seeing this, not just councillors, but a lot of people out there that we call the public <coughs> are seeing these problems. And you're saying that if it's necessary, then a service will be provided. Well, who defines necessary? And Linden Lodge is not the place to be used. You've used that in other arguments to sway people to other places because it's outdated. It's not your purpose, not um, fit for purpose. You've used that argument. You cannot now bring it back and say, well, we can send people there because we don't want to go there. So I'm getting, I'm really annoyed that a, an excellent service that could prove its worth has been treated like this and pushed out. And that's got to come down to money. It can't be anything else. But the people, it's not just the money, it's the loss of service to the people. And I fight for those people as much as anybody else. So you can't rationalise this as something that is going to happen because it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't be allowed to happen. We had a perfect service. You couldn't you couldn't get better service anywhere, but now it's on the wane. You're not you're not putting people in there. So if, well, there weren't enough people in the ward, so close it down. Let's save that and put it somewhere else. You can't put those services into people's homes. No way can you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you. A I, 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 I passionate um, thing there. I, mean, I don't think there's a question in it, but but what actually from it from what I, I got from that really is is you've said about the, we've now got the eight beds and it's fifty percent capacity in there. Yeah. Um, where where are that where are those four people going to be then if if they're there's a requirement for them to be in Chatsworth now. No, they, so apologies for interrupting you. They were the there were four patients in there at the point we closed the ward, and they yes. were all discharged home. So they're all being managed in their own homes now. Yeah, but they but they were in they were in in the ward for a reason, weren't they? Because uh, that's as, where opp the as opposed as opposed to others, as opposed to others where they, where you're treating them at home. They were actually in the ward, and I know you've put them at home uh, because of the COVID situation. But but you know what what is their level of care at home compared to what it was in Chatsworth, when clearly they needed to be in Chatsworth in the first place. I think that's what um, Yv Yvonne was getting at. It is you know it, it is it is highly regarded as, as a service in that area. Um, and by, by you know, the councillors on this committee who have fought really hard to keep it open. And, and, and my concern, my, my concern is, is, is you had four people in there anyway. You've moved them out because of COVID. Yeah. What level of care, what's the impact on their level of care where you felt that initially they had to be in the ward, but now, now because of COVID they can't be? So the reason... I think the the reason that before um, people, we only had the option of an inpatient service with a small level of outreach, we didn't have the resource in the community. By closing the ward, we've been able to put the staff in the community. So the reality is, at the point we closed, we had four people receiving that care, and now we've got 23 people receiving care in the community so obviously if we if we if we reversed it only eight of those people would then be receiving a service instead of the 23 who can receive it at the moment 
Okay, but are, are, are you are you saying to to the committee that the the level of care those people that you took out of chats with and put and look after them in their home is of the same high standard? Well, it's the same staff delivering that same standard of care. Yes, the difference is they're not because it's not residential. We're not providing the round the clock. Um, you know, we're not feeding them. We're, we're not doing those things that um, they're now happening in their home. If they need support with that, then we, we're looking at um, ha working in partnership with our social care colleagues. And that's how it's worked during this period very successfully. Um, for, the, for the vast majority of families, that's better than 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 their their relative not being at home. Yeah, I, I, I get do, that. I, 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 think, do I think we all get that. Yeah, I do understand the concern, but I think I, I can only give you assurance that the the patient the patients who who met the criteria of Chatsworth, we can safely deliver them the same standard of care in their own home. I'm absolutely confident of that, and I think it's an improvement. What, what I do recognise is that there were probably patients who were in Chatsworth because it was there who actually really should have been in a higher standard of, of care. And, you know, if people need a, a bed, we don't want to keep them in the community because we have to carry that, that risk. We want them to be in the right place that they need. OK, thank you. Thank you. I've got Muriel want to come back. Chairman, in. can I come back, please? Yeah, of course you can. Sorry, sorry, Yvonne. I did ask questions, Chairman. Oh, sorry. I um... asked, how can you provide physiotherapy in a home service without any equipment? Oh. And who defines necessary on these services? And nobody's um, answered that question. Sorry. Well, well, I'm a physiotherapist. I'm a physiotherapist and we have physiotherapists every day at this moment who go out and deliver care that once upon a time you could only get in hospital. We get access, we get equipment from the ISIS store and and you know if so if they need equipment that's what they do. And of course the other the other thing we do is we deliver the physiotherapy relevant to the environment the patient lives in so one one of the problems you sometimes have is that you can mobilize really well with equipment in a hospital and then you get discharged home but your house isn't like a hospital so you know then you have to relearn it all over over again with what what will work for your stairs or your bed or your living room so i am confident that we can we can do that and uh, our staff are experienced in doing that uh, sorry, Yvonne, I, I, I didn't mean to sort of get to say anything. I, I, I was involved in your uh, compassionate... Um, uh, I understand. ...what you said, really. Like, are yeah. you happy with the answers now? Or that they've, no, they've... I'll never be happy with the answers oh, no, because be, be I do that not you... believe that the care that was provided at the community hospital on Chatsworth Ward could ever be provided elsewhere, and it's never been provided at Kings Mill the same either. So all we're doing is watering down and watering down until eventually it'll disappear. And that's what NHS wanted in the first place. And that's what they're getting now. Well, I, I don't believe they want to get rid of the old service. Yes, they do. I think that's a bit, a bit too much. I think it's how, how they deliver that service. Um, um, Muriel, then. I just want to just make one further comment and a question, if that's OK, Chair. Um, I think often and when I was an officer I used to think that councillors were too wedded to buildings that sometimes when we were recommending that a unit should close it was councillors who stepped in and if it was local said no 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 you're not closing our local home I appreciate that that's how we're seen my understanding of colleagues here that isn't that we're wedded to a building it's about what happens there and it's interesting that in the very full consultation that took place with regard to the new rehab centre, one of the um, uh, issues raised by clinicians uh, uh, in the south, I think some in Derbyshire as well, 
uh, was a concern that the the the, the uh, rehab centre <coughs> wouldn't provide enough places, and and their concern was about how how it would all be resourced. Um, and I suppose yeah, so it, it's the the balance between. And I take your point that styles of support have changed and and our learnings developed, but still seems to me you need at one end of the range, um, residential support to people. I mean, as counsellors, we do hear from carers who are supporting a family members at home after strokes or uh, in neurological conditions. And they often uh, share their concerns with us that, you know, they'll say things like, you know, I'm being expected to do the sort of things that the, the trained physio does and that, you know in the middle of the night I can't turn a husband or you know I think we have to take into account as well the stress on carers if there's no respite of return to a residential unit for someone to be just moved on a bit or given more specialist support I think it's just losing the balance that worries me I, I quite agree with the expertise in the community but I just think the new re rehab centre, it, I and mean, we can't change where it's placed. Uh, we need to work with that, and and the trust is working with that in terms of transport and so on. But I, I just don't. I think we're losing essential uh, beds to keep the balance between support in hospital and support in the community at this time, particularly where we we don't even know how the the new rehab centre is going to work or how effective it's going to be. I mean, we hope it'll be excellent, but it won't meet everybody's needs. Uh, anybody going to come back in on that? Or? Um, so Councillor Gunning, it's Lucy here. I um, What I, I think is, and I think what um, Dr Simmons was saying, and of course he was seeing it very much from the hospital lens, is we've got a complex pattern of various... Um, different rehab needs and we need to possibly look at them all together so I, I am what I am beginning to wondering wonder because we're talking in this conversation about different types of rehab aren't we so we've got um, we've got the new rehab centre that is going to deal with people post head injury complex uh, needs who have rehab potential uh, and post major trauma and that's one stream of patients that will go there we've got we have um we have stroke rehab beds in uh, NUH for patients who might need rehab slow stream rehab following stroke. We've got the community service that we've talked about, and I think and then we've got the concerns that both Councillor Wright and Councillor Woodhead have, have um, raised about people who are who are living with enduring um, neuro rehab needs, and I do wonder whether what we need to do is kind of just and I'm just kind of looking at Stephen largely and maybe Catherine whether we need to kind of just map this out as simply as we can and share back with the committee when we look at all these rehab needs how we think we will service them going forward in beds and in community services and bring back the full picture to you because I think the trouble is we're looking at individual bits and I do understand and I feel a personal sense of responsibility that I hope the committee don't think that this is we've we've been moving to a foregone conclusion because it's absolutely not the case. Um, we absolutely haven't done that. Um, but I think we haven't we haven't mapped out the true picture, have we? That, you know, once there were however many beds on Chatsworth, this is how those patients, these are where there are beds in NUH, these are acute rehab beds that are in Sherwood, and this is the community service, this is Stanford Hall, and this is how it'll all look going forward. I just wonder whether we, we ought to do that. Yeah, I think that, I think that would be very helpful because, you know, it, it is difficult sat, sat yeah. here. Trying, trying to imagine how it all work, and, and I absolutely, absolutely uh, respect the, um, you know, your, your views as the, as the uh, clinicians really that deliver the service on, on what's best for the patient. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a, a strong feeling within the committee that um, the mix isn't right. You know, um, and, and I think that's, that's the main thing that comes out. As, as Muriel rightly said, it's not about buildings, really. No. You know, it's about the service that was being delivered in that building, which was 
uh, very impressive when we all went to visit and saw the staff and saw the passion of the staff. Everybody's commented on how how, um, how good they are and, and, and how they work together. And, and even today it's been mentioned by yourselves. So uh, so I think I think my my view, and I, I think we can call, draw, I know people have said they want to speak, but I think we can draw this to a conclusion that we, we come back with this, we, get, we have this brought back to us uh, with that sort of mapped out so we can look at it in more in more detail and, and get a better view of it and then we can we can sort of go from there. Do I get a general uh, consensus of approval from the committee from that, please, that, that we'll, we'll bring this back, yeah? Can I, okay. Yeah, can I just ask, Councillor Gurning, if we do that, it's it, we could we will need quite a lot of agenda time, actually, because it's, it's a yeah. big piece of work, yeah. but it's one that needs <laughs> yeah. done, and we need to bring acute community and all the yeah. different clinicians together, and we need, and I think what we'll perhaps do, I could pick up with Martin, we might be able to send you something high level in advance that tabulates what we think the current provision is, and then we can dive into it, but I would say we would need um, a fairly considerable piece of time. Sorry, not to, um, I know you were trying to bring it to a close, and that's absolutely right. What, what I would still say is the reason we came today to to you is, to, is so that we could, well, Catherine, and and Knotts Healthcare could start to talk to their staff about the future of this service and therefore their future. And um, we'd like to, we have an imperative, we want to do that as soon as we can. So, yeah. um, I, I mean, I'm looking for guidance from Martin Gately, really. And, and I've also got <laughs> my business manager on here <laughs> from the group. Uh, we, we have done an emergency meeting before where it was a single item meeting. Um, I know how difficult it was to actually arrange that, but I think I think this is such an important issue um, that's not just really for Mansfield; it covers the whole of the county. Um, I think we, I, I personally think we should have a, a, a quick as possible uh, single issue meeting. Um, just get everybody on there who can who can attend. Is that is that? I'm, I'm looking at Martin Gately because he's the one that's going to have to do all the Jim, jumping sorry, around. Sorry. Subject to Councillor Butler's guidance as business manager, of course, we, we actually don't have a meeting in early January at the moment. Our meeting is in late January, around the, the 26th. So I suppose, um, you know, we might be able to fit something in there if that fits in with you know, Lucy and her team thinking? being able to. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if we call it rehabilitation services, um, and the only problem, yes, that's yeah. I, I think we. I don't know what you think, Stephen. Is that doable? Yeah, I, I think we obviously we need. Um, yeah, we need, to, we need some time to map it map it out. But obviously, yeah, there is a there is a pressing uh, pressing time scale in terms of getting um, moving forward some staff consultation. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just for clarification. What what was the proposed date? Or, or a rough time scale? I, I, I don't early have early a January. Early January. Some, sometime in early January. Um, yes, I mean that would obviously clearly be doable from a um, in terms of drawing that information together. Um, I'd probably just look to Catherine in terms of implications on on the staff consultation for Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. Well, it it just means we won't be able to start it, so it just leaves staff hanging, doesn't it, till uh, after Christmas. Yeah. I think it's a piece of work, and, and I, I, I think it's a piece of work we need to do. We need to do comprehensively. The major issue is I think that we need to get all the right clinicians in the room. So it's not yeah. just it's yeah. the acute hospital doctors who look after these patient hot cohorts, as well as the community. Because I think Catherine's given a very compelling uh, um, view about the community perspective. So I think we need to. It could be just organising that. I think, but. Um, okay. I think I think be, I appreciate what you're saying about about the staff. Um, you know, it's and it is over Christmas. It always seems to be over Christmas when when there's when there's change. Um, but I think if you if you can give the, the staff the reassurance that, that that we're looking to make sure that the best service is being given to the residents in Nottinghamshire, um, and that if if that means that we give a recommendation for that place to stay open, to, or or to be some provision there. Then, then that's that's our responsibility and duty to do that as councillors on the health scrutiny committee. Um, so I think it's you know, it's an important issue that, that's very, that we feel very passionate about, and and that and that will be a good way of, of, of doing it. And I hope the staff will understand that our intention behind that is 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 proper, and and it's a, and it's right for what we're doing. Yeah, thank you. That's fair enough. 
So I'll, 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 if you put your hands down, then I'm not going to let you speak now because I think we've resolved. I think we've resolved that they're going to come back early January, um, and then we'll have all the facts in front of us, and then we we can be uh, well informed to make our decision on what our recommendations will be. Are we all happy with that? You know, nobody, not, nobody going no. Yes, Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Are you are you you under are you all happy in what what's required then, Lucy, and particularly you, Martin. <laughs> In terms of what your your job is now, yes, I, I think so. I'm trying to find the right date for a meeting in early January, Chairman. Yeah, well, I think nobody's doing anything on the first of January. <laughs> Very good. That, that's the day we'll use then. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. I'm sure we can find a date that we're that we're, at least the majority of us are available. And at least the major and, and, and that they can find substitutes if we have to do that. But I think it's such an important issue that we do really need to to um, get it back on the table and talk about it. Nothing quite like coordinating diaries. It's a good challenge. Yeah, well, um, you know, I like to give you something to do. <laughs> I know you got plenty of time on you. Thanks for that, everybody. Really appreciate your input. That takes us then on to item seven, which is tomorrow's. <laughs> NUH, the report provides an initial briefing on service developments on NUH following the award of seed funding from the Department of Health and Social Care, Health Infrastructure Plan 2. Lucy Dadge and Nina Ennis will now introduce the item in more detail. Over to you. Um, sorry, Councillor Gurley, I'm sorry to be difficult again. Do you want me to also just give you a note on Lyndon Lodge? Because I haven't covered it. I've kept yes. saying I would cover it. Yeah, yeah um, let's, do that. let's do that now then. Let's do that yeah. now. So yeah. this is about the NRC. So yeah. your concern, as I understand, I wasn't at the last meeting, is that Lyndon Lodge will close, and it's, it's a reflection of this last conversation, without you being assured that there is adequate provision for all the patients that would have been treated in Lyndon Lodge in our NRC. So I, what my message would be to you is, and there is, a, and Councillor Woodhead, I can assure you that the Chatsworth issues are not about money. We're not decommissioning a service, uh, but we're changing the location. But in this case, what we wouldn't be able to do is we wouldn't have the staff to run Linden Lodge and, and run NRC in tandem for a, for a period of time and it's partly about money but it's also partly about not having the expert staff so the key is to make sure that we don't just shut Linden Lodge one day and hope that NRC picks the patients up that we transition properly so um, this is obviously a matter for the trust and the messages that I've had is that we'll, tr we'll plan the transition based on complexity of patients and the, and the new the NRC won't be um, open from day one so there'll be a three month period as we move patients that need to move from Linden Lodge into NRC and we recognise that nobody will get stuck because rehab potential for somebody who's just had a, a, a major trauma is timely so if you're in Linden Lodge and you need that and you need that rehab and Linden Lodge is the only place while NRC gets set up you will get your care so there'll be a transition period the transition plan will span over nine months so that's six months before Linden Lodge closes and three months after NRC opens so they'll kind of open in parallel um, patient safety will be our major concern um, but the trust have reiterated they wouldn't have the nursing staff to double run in the longer term, but there'll be a three month, a nine month transition. Um, now, um, to pick up uh, Councillor Woodhead's comment, you are right. We have said that Linden Lodge in the longer term is not a safe environment to treat these patients, and that 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 is the case. Um, just to remind you again that so so patients that can go to NRC will go. They won't be picked up and moved if they're not ready. Uh, so it could potentially be new patients that go into NRC, um, nine month transition period, um, and we have a, we have an in, we have an inpatient stroke rehab facility at NUH which will stay on the city campus beyond. So hopefully that so so I think we are hopefully giving you an assurance that there will be a transition period. And it's down to the patients that are in the unit on the day. You know, if the patient, if the unit opens on the first of the month, and a patient has a major trauma on the second of the month, 
uh, who would benefit from the the physical facilities in in Stamford Hall. They w- we will move them. They will go in. They won't be moved. They'll be admitted to Stamford Hall. If you've got a patient who's part way through their rehab in Linden Lodge and they would be disrupted by being moved, they won't be moved, and we'll run it like that for a period of time. So and we can that's we basically come nine, to you. over a nine month period, Lucy. Yeah, then. six months before, three months after. Obviously, as I say, particularly the major trauma, it's on the day it happens, isn't it? Yeah, that yeah. You I need to work that. out where's the best place for people to go. But there will be a stroke rehab service in um, NUH, and as I said, we'll talk to you more about that as when we bring the wider rehab. But what we will definitely do is bring you that transition plan back um, uh, at, at close to the time. I'm quite happy to have that minuted. And we can we can help you. You know, we 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 we're quite happy to report sort of almost patient by patient on how people are moved over. Okay. Well, but personally, I'm feeling a lot more reassured by that. But what what about you? Any any uh, anybody want to say anything? No. We're, we're, so so go on, Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a clarification on that. Uh, what? Uh, uh, Julie's just said. So it isn't a money problem. So it's a staffing problem. And if it's a staffing problem, that's a recruiting problem. Is that how I see it or am I wrong there? Um, I suppose you are in the broader sense, yes. I mean, these are very specialised staff and part of the model, the workforce model behind the NRC is that we recruit even more specialised staff and we train them. So I suppose to some degree you are right. Some of the some of the people that are going to work in um, the NRC haven't been trained yet because these are new skills that we are yet to train them in. Um, and I suppose what we're saying about NRC is it gives us a real focus to develop that workforce. So yes, I think you are technically right. Councillor Greaves, yeah. I, th- I think a lot of it is is, is you need. It's like if you've got two places open, it's like having double staff, isn't it? Is that it is that is, is that what you're it saying? It is absolutely. That is right. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I think what what won't what won't happen for your assurance, you know, if if, if from the minute the, the unit is open, the right people will go there. We will minimise the number of people that get tra- get transferred from Linden Lodge into NRC because that's generally not going to be good for them, is it? So the the hope would be that people that are in, in Linden Lodge when the unit open, finish their care in Linden Lodge and go home, and that new patients go into NRC. That's how we want to manage it. Okay. Are you happy with that, Kevin? Some more more days, Connie. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Uh, Well, at that then, uh, the question would be, when you recruited the staff, would they go back to the Chatsworth? Because, uh, just going back, just going back in time a little bit to Bassett Law Hospital and the children's ward, uh, that was closed because of a shortage of uh, uh, paediatric nurses. So so therefore then, I'm going to say, even if they had got nurses brought forward that's been trained, that ward still wouldn't open. It still wouldn't open even today. And I'm going to say that would be the same with the chats were. Yeah, I mean, I think we need, when we come back to you, I think we need to just, so there's this community rehab staff. Most people that do rehab are therapists, they're not nurses. And there'll be people that do it in, in, community settings and there will people do it that do it in highly specialized bedded settings and there'll there'll be whole new professions that we haven't parts of the profession that we haven't trained yet. We'll 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 bring that back to you I think in, in January if that's okay and just explain it to you. Yeah, okay. Yeah uh, I've got uh, Councillor Martin next please <coughs> Yeah chair thank you. Uh, um yeah I, I apologize for forgetting where Stanford Hall is. Uh, and the National Rehabilitation Centre. I couldn't remember the name of it. Mount Mowbray was the nearest place I could think of to it. But at the end of the day, I think the issue here with that, Linden Lodge and with Chatsworth, they're all intrinsically linked, of course. So I, I just like, I bet Lewis is in the background kicking me. Um, you know, uh, when when do we expect uh, Stamford Hall to open to the public and the change between Linden Lodge to occur between Stamford and Linden? And of course, the other issue is, is where, where councillors are getting mixed up with the, the, the actual 
progression or path that you're taking is what you're saying is you've evolved the services because they've changed and how you deliver them and COVID has accelerated that and it's made it safer for the patients to stay at home and possibly safer for the workers. I, I know it's a, it's a very toxic issue because it looks like we're closing a war and I could agree with what Kevin's saying but but what they would say in the NHS is it's a redefinition of the service and not a closure. I know that's a political statement, if ever I heard one, but but that's how you're dealing with it. So what you're saying is you're going to do better with the resources that you've got. That's what yes. you're going to do. And we are going to, and we and we are also also going to create new resources. And you're able there to care. Be. You're able to care for more people because you've diversified there, yeah. your resource. Yeah, there will be more staff in the National Rehab Centre. Whether that's the right way or not, Yvonne, is a matter of conjecture. All right, thank you. Well, there, okay, can, uh, John Doddy? Uh, yes, I was just going to say um, that the devil is clearly going to be in the detail, and I think it would be a, impossible for people to say that what's proposed by Lucy is good or bad at five minutes at the end of a, a three and a half hour meeting, where there's obviously quite a bit of brain fatigue probably settling in. I think uh, an opportunity to see, digest and, and review what's in the plan as opposed to just the idea that it sounds good. Anything sounds good at this time of the morning when you've listened to two yeah. and a half think, hours of, of, of this. Now, oh, be quiet, hold it, hold it there for a moment, Lucy. I've only just started. Got another three and a half hours to talk. Uh, so. I've I, I got to say to you, the, the staff probably in the National Rehabilitation Centre, I mean, what percentage of them are going to be the exact same staff that were in Linden uh, Lodge, etc.? And how many of them are going to be new or not? Necessity is the mother of invention. At times of a COVID outbreak, we could train up nurse after nurse after nurse to run intensive care units and incubators and Nightingale hospitals, etc., etc. Where does the will, there's a way. So I, I think at this moment in time to welcome with open arms your suggestion would probably be a, a, a little bit true fatigue. And I think I, I would certainly like to see a lot more of the detail behind it rather than nod and consider it to be in any way uh, uh, satisfactory. Does that make sense to see? It, it does. I'm not suggesting for a minute that we've got the transition plan because we haven't because we're three or four work years mm. away from it. I'm just saying that we at the moment we envisage it will be a nine months transition. Um, we will, we are happy to come back to you with that transition plan, which will depend on how many patients are and the type of patients in London Lodge at the point at which we know that the rehab centre is going to open. So we will share that and we bring um, NUH with us to go through that with you in detail. Brilliant. OK, I'm going to move us on now because we've got to it's, we've been going on for quite a long time and we've still got another cut two items. So that takes us on then to item seven. The report provides an initial briefing on service developments at NUH following the award of the seed money. Yeah, I've said that a bit anyway. So if you want to lead on, Lucy. Yeah, so I was going to take a bit longer on this, so I'm going to have to sort of skip through a bit. So um, just to recap, as you all know, tomorrow's NUH is part of a national hospital rebuilding programme called the Health Infrastructure Plan, which is planned to deliver a long term rolling five year programme of investment in new health infrastructure, including capital to build new hospitals, modernise the primary care estate, new diagnostics and technology, and importantly, eradicate safety issues in our existing um, estate. Um, phase one of the programme includes six new large hospital builds due for completion by 2025, none of those in, in our patch, with phase two including 21 more schemes with the green light to go to the next stage. And phase uh, tomorrow's NUH is therefore a phase two HIP scheme. And as the chair says, we've got seed funding to develop the outline plans to get to the next stage. And just to fix the date in your mind, phase two projects are expected to be completed within the time scale 2025 to 2030. Um, just so that you're aware, um, NRC is also a HIP scheme. So just briefly to go over the process, hopefully you are all familiar with this because you're, you're seasoned um, in your role. Once you've agreed a major capital new build, there are two phases to get there. And this is a massive new build. Um, and firstly, the CCG will lead on a pre-consultation business case. 
which once approved and you are part of that process leads us on to public consultation so that's the ccg's role and then depending on the outcome of the public consultation we would hand over to the sponsoring trust which is nuh again to develop their capital bid to get the new proposal funded so at the moment we're at the first stage of the process uh, where the ccg are working with nuh and other ics colleagues and wider stakeholders like yourselves to deliver the new care model that meets the needs of our population because this needs to be about a new care model we need to start there and the buildings come next so our role as a ccg and what we're here to talk to you about today is not the hospital build but we want to be sure that the volume and configuration of services that new buildings will house is absolutely fit for the services that our population will need in future and I think we will no doubt be back to you many times with this and I think we'll all be wrestling with um, you know we are looking a long term into the future here um, so we've got to work with some degree of um, risk on in, in understanding now what we think we'll need in the future. We have got to make sure that it's affordable and we've got to make sure that where we put facilities are accessible to patients they serve um, and that inevitably means that it's not just a new hospital, but our future ambitions for primary and community mental and physical health services and also social care sit round this new hospital. So that's just my code for saying we're working with NUH, but we also need to work with Sherwood Forest because colleagues have mentioned very eloquently. We do have an acute hospital in the north of the county or the middle of the county, Knox Healthcare, the ambulance service, um, our own GPs and commissioners from other parts of the region will all be interested in this. So that's the preamble. Um, we are working and and um, as you will know, this is um, a policy that the current government are very much pushing. So we're working to some really tight diet deadlines to secure the funding. We're in the pipeline. The money is kind of there with our name on it, but we've got to go through the appropriate processes to support that. So in summary and these are very tight deadlines um, we've got some first thoughts that I'm going to just briefly outline today which we will take to the regional clinical senate which you'll probably be familiar with uh, as a process for bringing independent clinicians across the region to look at our plans um, based on what they say um, we will want sign off from all of the providers in, in, in Nottinghamshire so not just NUH that this plan for the new hospital is fit for the future and then our governing body will look at that internally uh, and we will have in parallel conversations with yourselves about a consultation plan and then you know what it is we're going to consult on so very very challenging time scales uh, once in a generation um, you know I'm obviously kind of uh, at the latter stage of my career but you know it is fantastic to think that we can do this for Nottingham and Nottinghamshire because this is a facility that we're all probably going to need at some point we can't squint stint on quality and detail but we absolutely have to do all that we can to access the capital whilst it's available because the messages are it won't be available forever um, I was going to give you a little bit more background, um, but you will know, won't you, that the two hospitals in Nottingham came together in 2006. NUH operates from three sites, QMC, City and Rope Walk. Part of the city campus goes back to the Victorian workhouse days. I worked there for many, many years. It's a great hospital, but the infrastructure is old um, and is becoming beyond. We, we have literally Victorian Nightingale wards is beyond useful repair. We know that the quality of care that is provided from NUH is good that's what CQC say but even the Queen's that was new 40 years ago isn't new and the rope walk is the last remnant of the old general hospital um, and isn't fit for purpose for modern services so the business case that supports um, tomorrow's NUH will address three main issues making sure that critical infrastructure that makes the hospital safe and work is replaced um, there is some urgent things we need to do, like we, we don't have enough neonatal cots in Nottingham for our population, so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. But we'll also need to do some of what we call major reconfiguration, um, which is what the, the, the meat of the case will be about. Um, we don't want this to be um, a rebuild of the same, but we want to make sure that the new hospital attracts the best workforce to Nottingham. You know, this is about care, but this is also about economic regeneration. It's about clinical research and innovation, and it is fundamentally about creating an environment that is the best place for our 
patients to be treated and our staff to work because we want to recruit staff. So um, massive, massive programme, as I say, once in a generation opportunity and one that I am personally uh, relishing. Um, we can probably say you can't preempt what's going to go into public consultation. You shouldn't, and we don't know anyway. But we do know that there will be some elements of reconfiguration required. Um, so we're carefully working through with NUH and other clinical co colleagues what changes they envisage we may deliver through the new hospital build. And some of those, and I think Lewis is still on the call, or is, is he gone? Some of those are what we're going to do, do some pre-consultation engagement on. Um, and I'm just going to mention these and I just be really clear, these are headlines of potential changes, nothing is certain yet. So we want to consolidate emergency services on one site. Uh, we don't know where that will be, but we think that's a good thing to do. Um, we want to create a women's and children's centre. And again, we don't know where, but we think that's a good thing to do. Something we definitely think we want to do, and COVID has taught us this, is we want to separate emergency and elective work wherever, so planned and emergency work wherever possible. Um, COVID has told us that, and, and we knew before, but COVID has exacerbated, that to make sure that you don't have to stop planned surgery, when planned care, when urgent care becomes very urgent and you have something like the pandemic, actually physically separating planned care and urgent care is um, something that you aspire to do. Now, you may phys physically separate them on one site, but you may put them on different sites. We just don't know. Um, we want, but as you know, we are a regional cancer centre. We want to bring as much surgical and medical and diagnostic treatment for cancer together as we possibly can. At the moment, we have some bits that happen at the city and some bits happen at Queen's. And we do want to shift ambulatory care into the community wherever possible. And again, we've talked about it today. We don't want people going for outpatient appointments for physio appointments where they could be better provided in the community and that doesn't necessarily mean at home incidentally that might mean in a community rehab facility um so there that's where our thoughts are going um and we are doing some pre-engagement around those thoughts nothing is um finalized um we have a huge amount to do uh, but we, I, what I want to say is we really, really want the public to be involved in this. Um, we've made no decisions about potential siting options. We've got to look at the sites we've got, their constraints for redevelopment, sites that we might be able to secure. We've got to put all of that in affordability envelope, but we really do want to land this as the best possible solution um, for our population going forward. So this is a point where I would definitely say from a commissioner's perspective this is not about buildings this is about getting the model right um, and this will all be wrapped up I and mean, we had a lot of conversation about NRC which is a small development this will all be wrapped up in a single document that we hope to bring to you next spring um, and next spring is the, that deadline is to make sure that we can keep that money that's kind of got Nottingham earmarked on it in central government so that's a canter through for me apologies um, but I would say definitely we will want more time with you on this in due course. Right, thank you. We're, we're losing some members because they've got other meetings going on this. Yes. Great done. I know, Liz, you've got to go quite soon, haven't you? Do you have a question, Liz? Oh, you're, you're on mute. Liz, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry? No, it's... I can lip read, you know. I can lip read. <laughs> <laughs> Dear, I must remember that. Um, no, only to say is it sounds a really exciting project and and, and really would like, I, I agree, we need more time to obviously um, hear more about that going forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks Liz. Right, I've got um, John Doddy then first. Uh, no, you, you don't actually have me, Keith. I just, uh, that's a historical hand. Okay, well, take your hand down then. <laughs> <laughs> Is yours historical, uh, Councillor Martin? No, unfortunately for you, it's not. I don't have to be unfortunate for me. You're going to ask, you're going to ask a proper question, aren't you? Well, yes, but my statements are not written down on a bag packet, which you know that's what I can't be accused of, can I? So it's critical that we continue to ensure that delivering health services is sustainable, aimed at maintaining clinical excellence. Of course, the mood music coming out of the government is one of NHS investment. We need, however, to look at the existing problems of debt. It's okay for the government to claim 
that they have these grandiose plans to build 40 hospitals and make dramatic improvements to many more of our hospitals. And I admire the aspiration. But let's not forget the Sherwood Forest NHS Trust hospitals are still splashing out over one million pound a week for the building and maintenance of Kings Mill Hospital. The sum equates to £134,534 per day, and it makes up... Councillor Martin, this is about NUH. Yes. NUH. It, uh, it's very clear uh, on the paper that it says NUH. It's about... Sure, NUH, it's about the future. Hospital care provision in Nottinghamshire, of which Mansfield Kings Mill NUH is... NUH, the future. Can put your questions on NUH, the future. Well, I'm just saying, you know, we've got a PFI agreement with... with well, that's all that got to do with so, so, Councillor Girling and Councillor Martin, I can respond if it's helpful. Um, just I would say I did work at Sherwood Forest for a period of time, and I, I don't think the cost of that building is a million pounds a week. Um, it is, however, more than it costs to run a non-PFI hospital, but what you get for that is a fantastic uh, estate that is fully maintained and will be fit for the next 30 years. What I can tell you, Councillor Martin, is a part of this project is that whatever we build in Nottingham needs to recognise that we have fantastic facilities uh, in the rest of Nottinghamshire, like the um, PFI at Kings Mill, like some of the lift buildings we've got in the city, and it's about using all of that to put us in a position where we've got the best estate for our population. So it will be, I, again, I can't make any, because I don't know, I can't make any promises about moving services from one to the, the other, but we certainly won't build anything in Nottingham that we know could be better provided in Mansfield. And that would be my answer. We, you know, it is a great facility staff. I've worked at both hospitals and uh, it's a great place to work as well as a great place to treat people. And what we aspire to, and I won't talk about PFI, but we aspire to have that quality of estate in Nottingham as well. Um, and, you know, hopefully this will be, this will be exchequer funded and it will be fit for the future. That would be my comment. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree with your comments. Uh, we did have a freedom of information. Councillor Martin, Councillor Martin, speak up for me. Speak up for me, Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, I'm the chairman. If I'm speaking, that means you don't. Oh yeah. Okay. Right, I was speaking. I'll give you your chance to speak, but don't speak over me. It was a reciprocal conversation that we're it doesn't matter. Having. It doesn't matter if it's a reciprocal anything. If I'm speaking, you wait for me to finish, and then I bring you in to speak. Well, if you don't like the way I ask the questions or why I'm I ask the questions. I don't care. I ask, I, you don't, don't ask questions. Can I make statements. Councillor Martin, just be quiet a minute. I'm fin I'll finish and let you come in if you've got a question. Thank you, Lucy, for answering that question. Yeah, but I'd like us to stick to the NUH because this is actually what the paper's on. Yeah, um, I, I like um, Liz said, this is very exciting, actually. Um, but it is about the service and not the building. So, we, we, you know, we'll be monitoring this very closely to see what, what plans you do come up with. And I appreciate that the timeline's very tight. Mm. Um, and, and we'll have to look at um, our work programme to fit it in so that um, as it progresses, you can bring it back to the committee so we can see and scrutinise what, what's, what the plans are. So I think that's something for Martin, uh, Martin Gately to make sure that we incorporate that in. And when we come on to the last item, uh, we, can, we can push on that really. OK, thank you for that. Right, Councillor Martin. Yeah, all I was pointing out was I don't want the same mistakes to be made in the not in the NUH hospitals as been made with the uh, Sherwood Forest Trust because the Freedom of Information request did say that it's costing a million pound a week. Right, okay, moving swiftly on. Anybody else got a question? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask if the. Uh, Who's speaking? Oh, Sorry, speaking. Uh, it's no, really, Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was just going to ask how much of the, the new build was actually based in, based on uh, private finance as opposed to grants, etc. And it, I mean, it, you may have worked in two centres, Lucy, and you may have said there are two yeah. centres, but you might not have had the responsibility for balancing the books, which is a yeah. completely different kettle of fish. And then that depends on what facilities you can provide for the people of the area going forward. So I, I think it's not an unreasonable no. uh, point. 
made by Councillor Martin, how much of the new facility will be based on loans and finances that could restrict the money available for other services, and how much will be grants? So, sorry, Councillor Doddy, I wasn't trying to suggest for a minute that I've been instrumental in either of these things. I'm just saying that what, what the point I was trying to make was that we've got King's Mill, it's a great facility. We will, is... make, we will make sure it is used fully and we won't duplicate stuff in Nottingham that we don't need to. Sorry, that was the point I was trying to make. I wasn't sort of trying to overplay my part in any of this. Um, yes. And that is a real part of what we need to do. Um, so if you're talking about NUH and how much will, will it come from loan. It's an exchequer funded. Tomorrow's NUH is exchequer funding. We're not, there is no borrowing, but you're absolutely, again, you are absolutely right that money that we spend on hospital services, we can't spend on community services. So we need to look this look at it in the round, don't we? Um, but it's government money that we're spending. It's not grants and loans for tomorrow's NUH. Fantastic. So that sort of completely clears up the difference between King's Mill private finance, big debt, and NUH, the future, which will be based on different sources of funding. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Doddy. Uh, uh, Councillor Woodhead. Thank you, Chairman. Just to um, put my two pennies into this argument, I don't think it matters where you build the hospital, if indeed we're going to build one. It's how you're going to staff it. We've got a staff shortage now in the hospitals we've got. So where are we going to recruit the staff that we need for a new hospital? Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, that's an extremely good question. Well, they many of the staff, well, all, all of the staff that currently work in the buildings that are NUH will transfer into the new hospital. Um, we are already, and I've got a colleague on the call who might be able to give me some headline numbers, but th this is what I was referring to earlier. We are already increasing the number of doctors and nurses we employ in Nottingham already, and we will continue to do that. Um, and I, I probably won't put my colleague on the spot, but we have a plan that says we need more substantive medical and nursing staff to deliver the care we need to deliver. So it'll be the hot people in the hospitals now, plus the additional people we're trying to recruit anyway. Plus, and that's why I mentioned this is about hospitals, but this is also about research and innovation. Plus, hopefully, we will attract people from other parts of the country, other parts of the world who want to come and work in our facilities in Nottingham. Um, and that is our plan to do that. And we do, you know, and we've said that it's not about buildings, but you you can use this sort of thing to generate interest in people coming to work, to work here, wanting to come to work here. Hey, are, you happy, are you happy with that? Lovely. Okay, so I think I think to conclude then, um, Lucy, this is the good news. Um, it we're is. We're liaise, if we're liaise, absolutely. It is good news. <laughs> Although it's tried to make that it wasn't. But anyway, it's good news. Um, I think we need to liaise with um, um, liaise with us so that it can come back to us when it's appropriate to do so, so we can see what the proposals are, and then, then the committee can have a good look at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we'll, and we'll move, move forward from there, yeah? Uh, so so thank you very much. I think that's you, done. You've had a, had yeah. a good day today. Yeah, if, I mean, Lewis is on the call, um, and just to be mindful, particularly for local councillors, that we are going out talking to our population now ahead of developing our proposals more formally, because you don't just work them up and then go to consultation. So we're doing a whole load of pre-engagement. So um, I'm Lewis can, I'm sure, interject here, but if you start to get questions from your um, your local um, constituents, then uh, please tell them to feed them in through those processes, because they can shape what we do. Okay, thank you. I've just had Anne come up actually. Uh, Councillor Greaves. You're on mute. You're on mute. Again, this bothers me. I'm going to put, I want a pound for every time I have to say that. <laughs> I don't want to lengthen the proceedings any further, but what I will be very, very interested in is say, uh, see what Lucy uh, is going to put in the report regarding how we are going to attract mm. uh, new staff and what we're putting in place to attract mm. new staff. Mm. That I will be very interested in. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks yeah. for that. Okay. Uh, did, did I see your, your angle, um, Martin, right? Or you took it back down? Accidentally, though, Jim. Okay, right. 
I'm just making sure you're watching. Oh, I'm watching all right. Don't you worry. OK, thanks for that, Lucy, and everybody thank else you. from the um, NHS and CCG and staff. And thank you very much for all that you're doing. Uh, OK, um, that takes us now on to item nine, which is the work programme. So introduce this item following the cancellation of some meetings during the lockdown period. The work programme has had to be revised and rescheduled. I now invite Martin Gately to comment, comment even in more detail. Thank you very much, Chairman. Obviously, during the course of this meeting, I've noted the requirement for tomorrow's NUH to come back to a future meeting and for there to be an additional meeting um, in early January regarding the rehab services. But our next meeting, our next scheduled meeting is on the 15th of December, and we're due to be looking at dentistry and orthodontic provision in Bassett Law, GP mental health referrals, as well as equity of access to GPs, and the engagement in relation to the emerging proposals in Bassett Law. And that's what we've currently got on the agenda for the next meeting, Chair. Thank you. Right, any, any comments for who we got? Councillor David Martin. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, as a result of that uh, debate, then, I would like to go on the work programme. Um, the uh, subject of the PFI debt about Kings Mill Hospital and Newark Hospital, because it's a huge waste of money, which could be spent on healthcare provision. And I think it's about time we have a look at it. OK. Put, put that on the list, Martin, of, of things to, to look into. Thank everybody you, happy with that? Sorry, I should have asked. Is every, everybody happy with that? Anybody not happy with that? Councillor yeah. Martin Wright isn't happy with that. Does anybody want to comment? Go on, Councillor yeah. Martin Wright. Can, can, I, can I just comment on that? I mean, the PFI business is old hat. The fact is that we're paying for that. We've got to pay for it. Apparently, I, I was told by the, the then chief exec of Sherwood Forest Hospitals back in 2009 or 10 that it's American money. Uh, and the uh, the government of the day decided they were going to borrow the money for King's Mill. We wouldn't have had King's Mill if the money hadn't have been borrowed. You can argue the fact that it may be too big because half of it's not used, but... I'm not sure it's a, it's a topic for this for this committee at all, to be honest. OK, you. what does the other members think? Have we ever got Councillor Butler? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Councillor, Mar uh, Councillor Wright is correct in that. I, I don't think this is the correct committee for a discussion about uh, a, a long held contract and, uh, and uh, decision was taken many years ago. This committee is the Health Scrutiny Committee to scrutinise the work that our frontline uh, NHS colleagues and staff are doing that would directly affect our residents. And with the greatest respect to Councillor Martin, and I'm no fan of P PFI, it's, com it's a complete mess everywhere. Every PFI contract has issues. But I would respectively suggest that this probably isn't really the right arena. And and you've had a very long meeting this morning with lots of very important items on the agenda. You've got a lot of very more important items coming on the next fixed agenda. We're having a special meeting to discuss the, the, uh, 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 the, the uh, other issue that we discussed this morning. And I don't think the committee is here to get embroiled in a, what is essentially a financial, financial and financing contracts type of matter. So that's my, yeah. my two pen of work on that. What, what, what the, Okay, Thank you, Chairman. I don't see what it would achieve. Can't alter anything. It's happened. It's there. Kingsmill's still a hospital. It's still a working <coughs> hospital. So what would it achieve if we discussed it for four and a half hours? Absolutely nothing. So pointless, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Right. And so that. So that. Uh, Gives you your answer, then, Councillor Martin. It's not. It's not going to go on the list. Can't, can't we lobby the? Can't we? Can't we, as a county council, lobby the government to do something about it? Then, if we're getting money money from the government to provide new NUH hospitals, surely they should be able to help. I think, us. as Councillor Butler said, that's not really the job of this committee. Well, what, which, which committee do we take it to then? Well, I, I think the, maybe I don't debt, know. The debt is having a crucial detrimental impact on the hospital, isn't it? Well, well no, it's, it's functioning. 
Anyway, that, you've that had your answer. Comes, that that answer. Say you've had, you've had, look, Councillor Martin, you can argue all you like, but you've had your answer. Um, I, I would ask Councillor Martin right. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Hopefully, to put to put this topic to bed, the Chief Exec of Sherwood Forest Hospitals has said times many that the PFI has no consequence to the health, uh, the treatment of people who go to that hospital. It's totally removed, nothing to do with it whatsoever. It just looks nasty when you see it in print. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, and that's why they want to have it on the agenda. Right, thank you very much, everybody, for your contribution. Uh, I'm going to draw the meeting to a close now. Bit of a, a mammoth meeting, but I think there's some really good uh, things covered there. And, um, you know, we've got, it, we've got that additional meeting as a result of it, which I think is uh, very valuable. So thank you very much for all your time and effort. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Bye, Chairman. everybody. Thank you, well Bye.